Item 96. A heavy tax should be levied against all parasites and sponges, such as the elderly, the infirm, and especially little podcasts. I felt like I had it more for the first three syllables, and then it got worse the longer it went on. There was also like a siren going by, so like kind of cut the Victorian mood a little bit, but that's okay. I apologize for living in New York City. I am so sorry, David. It's no problem. That I happen to take up residence in the city that never sleeps, David. Doesn't sleep. Doesn't it sleep. Doesn't. It doesn't. The Not siren's like still going on. Foggy London town. No, I hear that place sleeps a lot, but you wouldn't know anything about that. Wow. David, we were just talking about, uh, right before this started, uh, just how uh, completely incompatible my apartment is for recording sound. It's so fun to be going on, like, month 10 of this, you know? December, baby. December. Mid, mid-December, mid baby, and this is posting when? February. February. So February will be 11 months, right? We're... That will that will February be eleven months. Will be eleven months. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Boy, yes. Yep. Yeah. But hey, a friend of mine's mom just got her vaccine. Oh, oh. Whom? She's a nurse. I don't want to say the name, but she's a nurse. She's been working this whole time, and she just got a vaccine. Uh, this feels like a great time to announce that I am uh, about to enroll in nursing school. <laughs> 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 nurse Griffin sounds. You know, like an ABC sitcom I would watch. Maybe Ken Jong's in there. You know, he's like your boss. Oh, probably. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a soft Dr. Ken reboot. <laughs> exactly. Um, I like the idea of like nice Grey's Anatomy. Like yeah. if yeah. Grey's Anatomy is twenty two minutes, that's not a bad version of it. No, no. Um, maybe I should reboot Scrubs. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Scrubs. What if there were Scrubs? Uh, America's favorite sitcom. Remember Scrubs? when Scrubs was a niche sitcom for a few mm-hmm. years that kind of would like get renewed by the skin of its teeth? And then like its star quit the show and ABC was like, can we get like two to three more seasons though? Like, can we just like never kill this show? Wait, they kept going after Braff? Yeah. I didn't know Scrubs was on ABC. They moved it. It was on NBC and then it was moved to ABC. Correct. Okay, okay, okay. I was really like, maybe I don't know what Scrubs is, for real. It, it was produced by ABC, and then NBC picked it up, and then NBC canceled it, and then ABC was like, we will not let this thing die. We'll move it In over to our network. eight. So who was the star? Who was the focus? The janitor? There's, there's a final Co- season. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Jesus. What, Eliza Coop. She was It was the like star. six people. Oh, I love yeah. Eliza Coop. And Dave Franco was in it. Oh, Dave Franco from from Easy. We love Easy. Yes, and Carrie Bichet, Taron yeah. Killam. They got all uh, these people. The final right. season, Ben, is almost everyone left, and Braff is in like four episodes as an advisor, and it's like Scrubs the new class. Right. Ugh. Wow. It's it's just no, like thanks. the X Files. It's this whole thing where they're like. No, what people love is the the scrubs themselves. And it's like, no, no, no. People like the actors from Scrubs. That's what they liked. They they got used to those guys. They don't just need anybody in hospital scrubs. Like, that's not going to keep them on board. The other thing that's so weird is that Scrubs never had the window where it was a phenomenon, like X-Files. It was no. always like a decent no. performer that they just wouldn't let die. And they ended up doing 182 episodes. It was... Its peak was, yeah, like a decent performer. It like it went from niche to decent back to like, oh, that's still on. Wasn't the other thing? I remember season eight having like a hard finale ending. Like they were like, we know this is our last season. Let's wrap up all the threads. They ended. They shot the final episode. And then ABC was like, no, we're going to ask you for one more. So there's like they had to sort of undo the packaging, Correct. right? The, the 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 finale of Scrubs, of course, everyone remembers the 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 episode naming convention was always uh, my blah, right? You know, that was the name yes. of every episode. Mm-hmm. So the the finale of season eight is called my finale, and JD Zach Braff like moves, you know, he like leaves uh, the hospital, you know, he moves to some other town, 
And then Jade, in season nine, he's like, I'm back, baby, like to teach you guys. But for part a couple time. episodes. Right. He made yeah. like so much money to only be in a couple episodes. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, my finale. JD intends to leave Sacred Heart to move closer to his son while yeah. he and Elliot <laughs> plan to take their relationship to the next level. He had a kid with someone else. He had a kid with Elizabeth Banks. God, somebody didn't watch Scrubs. Mm. I thought I did. He had a kid with Elizabeth Banks and it is revealed. It was one of those end of season reveals where like he's like, and everything's going good for me. And then she like shows up at his house and she's like an old girlfriend. You know, she was in old episodes and she's like, I'm pregnant. And it's like, whoa, you know, and like then so season six, they had to figure it out. And in season six, episode one, they revealed that he got her pregnant without having sex because he like jizzed near her. Oh, boy. Okay. okay. Is that Enough. why people thought that in like middle school and high school? There were always all these like, you got to be careful or like the, that's how you get pregnant. I just really clearly remember a scene where he describes to Turk, the best character on Scrubs, of course, Donald Faison. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That like they were having sex, but he got too excited and like finished before they started. Oh boy! And Turk laughs at him, and, and it's that got like, her oh, pregnant. Oh my god, JD! Like you know, he can't even get pregnant regular. I don't know. I'm sorry. Scrubs. How many how many cult sitcoms have Elizabeth Banks get pregnant by one of the leads in the last couple seasons? Uh, I'm sorry, your 30 Rock is the other one. Is there a third? Are you trying to find a trend here? I'm trying to find a trend here. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was apparently on American Dad. Is there something you could do with that, maybe? Mm, maybe. I don't know. Apparently, she dropped in for seven episodes of Modern Family. Okay. So, you know, people are always getting pregnant on that show. It's a family show. Well, it's modern. It's very modern. But you can't forget. That family is so modern. We still haven't caught up to them. <laughs> God, I'm so glad Modern Family's off the air. I don't want to see like Modern Family confronting COVID. Same with Scrubs. It's so good that some of these like the shows that I that had a lot of strengths but could be a little cloying if they wanted to be. The last yeah. thing I need is their pandemic takes. You know, Curb Your Enthusiasm is filming again now. Well, that I cannot wait. That'll that be good. sounds great. Yeah, that'll be the best. But it's it's set post vaccine. It's it's set when things are like under control. But apparently Larry David is just like uh, completely paranoid on set at all times about catching it. I just I'm I'm somewhat perplexed by the decision to not just wait a year on his part. I I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell me either. Um, you should probably introduce the show and the new miniseries and our guest. Sure. Uh, this is Scrubcast, a podcast in which we <laughs> recap Scrubs only from memory. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we're kind of hostile to it, yeah. even though it was a perfectly charming show. We're like, well, what's your fucking deal, Scrubs? <laughs> I've, I truly have not ever seen a single episode. So uh, I, would be, uh, I would be learning Scrubs from memory. Right. You, you're the noob. You're the this Scrubs is like, noob. This is like Simpsons play, but for Scrubs. I, hey, right. David, that's a great take. Our podcast is about a a, a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed young right. podcaster stepping into the world of Scrubs for the first time. Overwhelmed, but, but with a rise, uh, sense of humor to all the obstacles. They face before them. I don't know. This podcast is called Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David, and it's a good podcast. Well, come on. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. But what's that? David, what's that off in the horizon? Uh, I don't know, but I think it's getting closer. Oh, it's a cruise ship. It's a big ship. It's a big ship, and they it has a banner atop it. And it's unfurling in the wind. I can't see it. The fog, all the fog, but it's coming closer. And David, the banner says, new miniseries. Wow. The banner. The best, banner. The best place to put a banner is on a boat. The new so fast. <laughs> it's, it's one of those mission accomplished banners, except it's the opposite. Oh, sure. It's saying, I mission see, started. Right. Mission accomplished. Remember mission that? started. Uh, Yeah, it was great. It was perfect. That was the moment we fixed America, and it's stayed fixed since then. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their career and are given 
a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Sometimes those checks clear, and sometimes they are unfurled atop a cruise ship baby. And this is a new mini series on the films of Musker and Clements. We're talking Disney Renaissance. It's called The Pottle Murcast. Wow, your voice trembled as you said that. <laughs> I'm I'm scared. I'm scared of the power of this miniseries title. The raw power it holds. The Poddle Murcast. The Poddle Murcast. We've finally done it. It's putting consonants together like they haven't been put together before. I honestly think, look, Fran, you need to understand, I'm a comedian, okay? I push boundaries and sometimes I miss. <laughs> But I have to try. <laughs> I have to try to put the Pottle Murcast together. Folks, we're talking Mustard Clemens. We're talking Disney Renaissance. We're talking Great Mouse Detective. And most of all, today, we're talking Radigan. That's right. It's a big subject. And in order big to commemorate subject, that, we guy. had to bring in a, a blockbuster guest. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Aliens with a Dollar Sign episode, from... The Public Enemies episode. Fran Hoffner is here. Hello. Wow. Hi. Also from, from, from life. From life. Thank you for having me back to talk about one of my favorite, presumably tenured professors, uh, Radigan himself. Uh, yeah, Professor Radigan. It was an immediate. Right. The second we committed to doing this, David said, and of course, Fran is going to come on to talk about Radigan. That's right. Every year I fire off one to three insane tweets about Radigan just to keep him <laughs> keep him in the mix, you know? Mm, mm. <laughs> oh, God. Now I'm going to look. Can we talk about, as, as we search for these tweets, do you remember your first exposure to Radigan? How did your relationship with Radigan begin? Did, is this a movie you saw as a young child? Did it stir the feelings in you immediately? Um, this is a, this is a great question. And I did research for this because I needed to figure out exactly what the deal was. So we had, um, a handful of VHS, Disney VHSs, but we did not have, we had both the full length feature films, but we also had the Disney sing along song oh, compilations. Yes. You're familiar with these. I oh, imagine. very. Yes. So we had two or three of those and one, and we had, and I went and looked these up and they have all the track listings. So I was trying to figure out which one we had, but we absolutely had the Be Our Guest one from 1992, which is, you know, predominantly Beauty and the Beast songs. I loved Beauty and the Beast, but also had, you know, random one-off songs, including, you know, Heffalumps and Woozles, but then also the world's greatest criminal mind. So this mm. was something I definitely watched from the ages of, I don't know, two to seven all the time. And I love Radigan. I loved him so much. I loved world's greatest criminal mind, which watching as an adult, I'm like, this song is not very good. Uh, but it's I was okay. just obsessed with this sort of like two minute clip. And they obviously sort of cut out the, you know, the execution of his henchmen from mm. this video. And it was just sort of rats boozing and looking at jewels. And I, I just sort of, I really loved him. Uh, and it probably wasn't until I was seven or eight that I got great um, mouse detective out from probably the library. We were a library VHS family, not a blockbuster VHS family. Uh, and I was like, this is actually too scary for me. And I don't like it um, because it has forced me to reckon with Radigan in the context of himself, which is horrifying. On his own terms. Yes. In a sort of edited music video, perfect, man. Do you think he's a professor at the University of Evil? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Something I wanted to ask. Tenured. Tenured. Easily tenured. It's an interesting, uh, I mean, memory you're jostling up here, Fran, because the, the Disney sing-along videos were very formative to me, too, but it... it it sort of like underlines this film's weird place in the Disney canon because those videos would often be like primarily themed around one of like the canonical movies, whether it was a classic or whether it was a renaissance, a more modern one. And those were the movies that were just always in the Disney conversation. Like I was a big fucking Disney kid. I was just like on the teeth for whatever they were selling me. But then there were the movies like Great Mouse Detective where – they would sort of ignore them 
other than when it's like it's time in the seven year re-release cycle was up, you know? And then you'd watch like a sing along video. And as a kid, you'd be like, what is this? Why does this never get discussed? What is this one? Who's this? Who's this gentleman rat? Yeah, I mean, it was my exposure to a lot of the ones that I just never really saw. Also, like bed knobs and broomsticks, like it just like they slotted in those ones that are not full musicals. And to this day, like I haven't seen bed knobs and broomsticks. I couldn't tell you what happens in it, but like I know I saw that song. I we also had the one that has um, whale of a tail, the Kirk Mm. Douglas iteration, whatever that sing along one was. So that for a long time, that was all I had seen of that film, like weird stuff got slotted in there. And I, so Radigan just sort of existed kind of contextless for me for a number of years. Zippity Duda would also yeah. always be on those sing along videos. And then you'd yes. be like, what is this from? And they'd be like, nothing. It's not from a movie. There's no movie. <laughs> I know my, I remember my dad was like, I guess we can talk about this. But like, I remember that that was his <laughs> way. Or he was like, I mean, I guess we have to talk about America's history of racism sometimes. So sure, zippity doo dah being on this yeah. fucking video right. is is the time to bring this up. Um, you know, zippity doo dah overrated. Don't even put it because they're always like, "Well, yeah, well, no, they 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 get Song of the South out of you know they they try to ignore it, except for zippity doo dah." And I'm like, "Why are you so addicted to zippity doo dah? <laughs> Just get rid of it." Yeah. Who it's also it? so fascinating where they're like, look, this movie is terrible. This movie is awful. We can never release it. It's a blight in our company's history. We have built one of our most famous theme park rides around it. Zippity doo that will be played at every possible opportunity. We will oh, never God. hesitate to play Zippity doo And you could just make up new words. Like they could have yeah. just remixed it. Blippity doo bop. Mm. Slow oh. zippity doo da. <laughs> blippity <laughs> blippity <doo-dop>. blue blop <laughs> but they should just kind of the same fucking, thing wow. they should knock down racist mountain or whatever world you know in Disneyland has to do with this <laughs> and they should build foggy London town instead they should have a great mouse detective world it's time to bring this movie back I think that's my opinion you know what they're actually doing I, I mean look I like that and we'll we'll get into that but you know what they're actually doing? They're replacing Splash Mountain with Tiana. Me. Oh, they are? Uh, oh, yeah. that's fun. Right, you told me that. Okay. I, right. That sounds great. That's yeah. another movie we're going to cover. That's really exciting. Exactly. That's why I'm bringing it up. But it's wild right. that it took that long. Um, this movie it comes at such an interesting fulcrum point. I mean, I feel like Musker and Clements are different than a lot of the directors we've covered before. I mean, first of all, they are only the second team we have covered behind the Wachowskis um, and and also they span this transition point to I think American studio animation being seen of as more of an tourist thing but they are very much from the old school where these are sort of collaborative movies these are not like you know filmmaker driven movies in the same sense if you look sure. at early Disney films they don't have credited directors right And then they get to a point where they have, like, a ton of directors. This movie has four credit directors. Um, The other two guys don't really direct after this. They remain Disney company men. One of them, I think, was much older. One of them sort of becomes more of a story guy. Um, But Muster and Clements did not come up the ranks as a team. They had sort of crossed paths in different areas, different points up until this point. They get assigned to this movie as two of four directors. And then this solidifies a thing where they become a team for the rest of their career uh, until they retired uh, fairly recently. But uh, they are a vessel for us to be able to talk about the Disney Renaissance, which is obviously this very transformative period in uh, animation in America. Um, We're going to talk about these guys. And I think they have a great body of work that's going to be really fascinating to discuss but right we are also just talking about a very influential you know moment in in commercial movie making like you know that they, they're they just also right. perfectly representative they're among the most influential directors on general culture that we have covered yes along with like spielberg right. and james cameron or whatever you know what i mean right. like, and they they touch a lot of other important collaborators and different movements and things going on but it is harder to find 
information centering them in the stories of these movies than it has been with the other directors we've covered up until this point. And I have to imagine that will continue being somewhat of a through line because the stories of these movies tend to be very collaborative they when do. they're retold now. But there's 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 much, you know, but these look, we're going to talk about it, but they have yeah. an, a very interesting their partnership has a very interesting genesis and it's it's you know while making this movie the great mouse sure. detective their first movie which they yes they co-directed with dave michener who i really know nothing about and bernie mattinson who's like still at Di- he's like disney's grand old man he's the uh the longest serving employee of walt disney ever did you know this he's 85 wow, years old wild and he still works there. He like worked on Ralph Breaks the Internet. You know, he's still going. Yeah, nice, um, great movie. He so he's just like he one of those guys who uh, uh, you'll know this term better than I do, Griff. He was he started out as an in betweener on Lady and the Tramp, mm-hmm. and in betweeners they they sure. draw like the boring shit in between the key frames, right? Like they're like they do the sort of grunt work, right. Right. The keyframes are the big poses. The in-betweeners fill in the gaps to move them from one pose to another. Um, Yes, it's the grunt work uh, of character animation uh, to some degree. But um, we've sort of covered different parts of this in different miniseries. We got into some of this in Roger Rabbit. Obviously, a lot of this keys into the origins of Brad Bird who we, uh, we covered on the show. But this is sort of this generation of CalArts animators who are all in the same class, all part of the same uh, sort of wave, who are kind of the last guys to be taught hands-on by uh, the kind of classic wise old men Disney animators. And so they're the last guys who are sort of like the giver style passed along the secrets of classic Disney style character animation and then are released out into the world to a Disney studios that doesn't is kind of in disarray, doesn't really know what to do with itself anymore, uh, is in shambles, is constantly questioning whether or not they even want to be in the animation business. Uh, Eisner takes over is literally run by a football player. Yes. Who was the physical inspiration for Radigan? That's right. Excuse me? Did you know that, Fran? Uh-huh. Yes, Ron He's Miller. Based on a who was, He's who based was, on a jock? He's based on a jock. What? <laughs> he, was, he was CEO of Disney from uh, 83 to 84. Are you telling me someone successful in sports became in charge of a company? Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, was a former, yes. A former tight end for the LA Rams in the 50s. Uh, and, uh, and he greenlit this movie and was the... Um, and said, I want to I look like a tenured rat. The thing about Ron Miller Griffin is he also greenlit yeah. Tron and Frankenweenie. He was like weirdly yeah. just and and he greenlit Roger Rabbit. He was like, let's try weird shit, right? Like he was the weird innovator before Eisner comes in and sort of, you know, start and Katzenberg, you know, they start streamlining back to like, no, Disney should be this beautiful, magical thing that families love. Like, you know, it's gonna be, we're gonna make right. this formula sing, baby. Okay, so he was a jock, he became a CEO, his body inspired a professor, and he's weird? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> oh, God. This is, I'm deep in Google Images right now, having a full he's on also, meltdown about He's also this. On, a, on a great Wikipedia list, list of celebrities who own wineries and vineyards. It's a good list yeah, to be. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Silverado. It's like him and Cameron Diaz, right? Yeah. Uh, man, what can I say? Ron, Ron Miller. He was the one who taught me it was okay to be weird. (laughs) (laughs) Here's the thing about that. I know the phrasing of that is a joke. I cannot (laughs) remember what it is referencing. It's been so long, you know, I don't even remember who said that. I don't remember what the origin of it was. I just feel like it's any time someone who is dies, very right. mainstream for being ultra dies. <laughs> right, it's right. like David Bowie. Wow, what can I say? I thought Bowie was the one that sort of it, cemented I think it was this. Bowie. There you go. I, I think sense. of Bowie as the linchpin. Yeah. Um, Ron hmm. Miller, th- they had already cast 
Vincent Price at that point and were basing it off of a Vincent Price performance in another movie and had started designing Radigan as being kind of like skinny and uh, uh, wiry and uh, nervy. And then Ron Miller walked in and they were like, oh, that would be interesting if he had that voice in that body. So that was the sort of like meshing of the two, which I think gets to the interesting chemistry of Radigan that makes him stick in your mind and your heart. Yeah, and I think what's both terrifying and alluring about him is his general size. Um, Mm -hmm. And is what is scary about rats in general is that like rats are not mice. Like rats are big. Too big. Um, They're too big. I agree. Way too big. Bring, 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 bring. Phone's ringing, and I'm picking it up. Click. Hello. Uh, hello. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing all right. How are you doing? And would you mind identifying yourself by name? Why, I'm the ghost of Vincent Price, of course. Oh, of course. Uh, yes, it's so nice to hear from you. We're discussing your your efforts in The Great Mouse Detective. Do you find me spooky, David? It's, sure. I mean, it's a little spooky to get a phone call from a g- g- ghost. You know it's even spookier than a phone call from a ghost, David. Tell me. Leaving your home. Yes, it's it's a bit of a spooky time to leave the home right now. I agree. Very spooky, David. Eh, by and large, I suppose you can get things delivered, you know. But what if you have to mail stuff and have to go to the post office? Too terrifying. Even I wouldn't suggest that, David. Yes, I would call it more of a hassle. But I yes, in I would these call times, it spooky. It, right. Well, I would recommend in you know instead uh, just mailing and shipping online at stamps dot com because they let you mail and ship anytime, anywhere from right, uh, right from your computer. Uh, letters, packages, all that stuff. That sounds convenient, David. Because do you know what happens when you leave your house during a pandemic? Uh, I don't know. You have to put on a mask. What else? Darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Creatures I don't know. I think crawl uh, in search of blood. To we might get terrorize <laughs> y'all's neighborhood, and whosoever shall be found without the soul of getting down must stand Are and you just face doing this the hounds of off hell. The top of your head, in rot okay. inside a corpse's shell. The foulest stench is this? in the air. All right. Okay. All right. Stop it. All right. Okay, Vincent. Wrap it up. The funk of forty thousand stairs. <laughs> uh, stamps.com you can uh ship usps ups and more it saved businesses thousands of hours and tons of money because here's what they've got all the services of post office and the ups in one place big discounts on mailing and shipping rates and uh you're going to get discounts of up to 40 percent off from the post office up to 62 percent off ups it's a fraction of those expensive postage meters And you can use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, package, or class of mail anywhere you want to send. You just schedule a pickup or drop-off. It's that simple. And grizzly ghouls from every tomb are closing in to share your doom. And though you fight to stay alive, your body starts to shiver. For no more immortal can resist the evil of Thriller. (laughs) Ha 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 ha. I finished it. It is good. It's great. It's very good. Yes. All right. Uh, Stop wasting time going to the post office. Go to stamps.com instead. There's no risk. And with my promo code check, you can get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. There's no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in check. That's stamps.com promo code check. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Because it's too scary. Sure. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's, that, that's fine. Eisner and Katzenberg come in, you know, like Katzenberg's a card counter. Eisner at this point is just like uh, a boss sort of studio chief. And they're yeah, like, we got to crack uh, Paramount, right? Like yes. That, that we got to crack yeah, the right. formula on this thing. Right. Um, the movie that's in production when they take over is Black Cauldron, which seemed yes headed in the wrong direction but was too deep to pull the plug and, and it's so also the great a, mouse a movie that that clements and musker were working on and stopped working on because they hated uh how it was going 
Yeah, is it, it any, was. Like, is it any good? I've. It's interesting. Hilariously, I've only seen it without sound and the background of a house party. It might be the best sure. way to watch it. It, it might. It's. I. I it's kind of cool I, looking. I, yeah. It. It definitely is like always spoken of as the one that kind of broke Disney animation, not just in its failure, but even just everyone who worked on it, kind of either like threw up their hands in frustration or got pushed off of it. That's the one that Tim Burton got fired from because his drawings were too creepy. And right. the movie is notorious for being too creepy. Right. It was, it was too dark and everyone was like, Disney's lost yeah. it. It's over. Cartoons are not cool for families anymore. Right. And there'd been the run of stuff before that, like Fox and the Hound and rescuers that were like marginal successes, but it was kind of clear like post Walt death that that the the magic was a little bit had waned. Yeah. Then Black Cauldron is them trying to sort of evolve the form. Uh, they're adapting more modern book series. It's like they moved away from sort of fables and fairy tales. And now you have things like the Rescuers and Black Cauldron, which are all based on somewhat contemporary book series, things that are less uh, hugely iconic. Um mm-hmm. And they were trying to, like, can we make a darker film? Can we make a big fantasy epic? Uh, But none of it's working. And The Great Mouse Detective was based on a book series called uh, Basil of Baker Street, which had been pitched a couple times internally at Disney as being good material for a film. But they kept on pushing it off because they thought it was too similar to The Rescuers. Like, we already have a mouse mystery-solving series, it is undeniable that this is just a boom time for fucking mice. Like the rescuers, yeah. the five old, yes. you know, movie comes out this year. This, yes. the rats of Nim, like it's a lot of rodents. I know Mickey, uh, you know, it's oh, the rats of Nim. Built. Yeah. You know, those guys. it's, it yeah. is wild to think that ever, suddenly it was just all mice all the time. Rodent PR was at an all time boom. Yeah. In the eighties. Within within a ten year span, Don Bluth made three mouse movies. Disney made three mouse movies, and two of those yeah. mouse movies were sequels to other mouse movies. And and it's 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 crazy. And none involved Mickey. No. Mickey, meanwhile, is just like yeah, he's just cleaning up the garbage. I guess I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like as you say, right? This this had long been gestating. They had I right. think done a Clements had created a fifteen minute. Sherlock Holmes animated short on Super 8 film that was sort of like floating around. That's what got him hired at Disney in the first place. He was right. a big Sherlock Holmes fan. But he he gets added to this project last because they yes. give it this sort of tentative green light. They do the couple years of story development. Then Black Cauldron comes out and eats shit. And they're yes. like, okay, we're, we're teetering on the edge. Do we shut down animation entirely? Apparently... Eisner at that point was floating the idea like our re-releases do so well every seven years we're re-releasing the classics in theaters they do so well and we have enough of them at this point we could just never make a new animated movie ever again and we'd be a solvent company just off the re-releases VHS comes about around this point in time so that adds some wind to the sales they throw the vhs into the the disney vault system where they're going to be released and re-released and unreleased every seven years as well with pinocchio being the first of those so they're a little more cash liquid and they're trying to decide like should we still be in this business and they look at great mouse detective and they go like this is low risk enough this feels more classical. It's lighter. It's sort of more the direction we should be going in away from Black Cauldron. But they go like, OK, we're going to cut your production time in half and we're going to cut your yes. budget in half. So it was like more, a twenty two yeah. million dollar movie that was supposed to take three years to animate. And then it becomes a year and a half at ten million dollars. Right. And then they add two extra directors onto it because it becomes an all hands on deck. We got to get this done movie. I think a thing I like about this film is it has this energy that I think Toy Story 2 has as well, which is just like you can tell it's made by people losing their minds. You can tell it's made by people who are so overworked and feel like they're fighting for the very survival of the medium they've trained in that the animation is all just loopy. Like the performances, the actual like character animation in this movie is loopy. This movie, yeah, that's fair. This movie's pretty weird, um, which I would not say 
is true of any other movie we're going to cover in this miniseries, right? I get oh, Treasure Planet, that's sort of, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like, by and large, this movie is just kind of tonally odd. It's uh, kind of sexy. It's more ad- adult than you want to give it credit for. And there's always those people who are like, ah, the hidden the hidden sex stuff, or like, this is more adult than you would think. But I think this one genuinely is like hovering in a weird place where like, I think when I saw this at full length as a child, I was like, this is kind of too scary for me. Um, and watching yeah, as an adult, right. I'm surprised by the adult stuff in it. Um, you know, that that nightclub scene is undeniably adult. The nightclub scene is w- the, what, what it's the hot. unhinged yeah. part, really. It's hot. It's hot. It's very hot. I'd like to go there. Yeah. But I think that also, like, you know, it, it speaks to animation being at this kind of amorphous point in its evolution, at least in terms of like a big studio level. And and Don Bluth has decamped like six years before this and is yeah. uh, going out making his own film, sort of saying like, Disney's done. I took all the best guys with me. We're going to start the new frontier. Spielberg has bankrolled Bluth. Uh, He's busy making his own mouse films. Um, This movie comes out, overperforms a little bit, just enough to let the axe sort of, uh, you know, to stop the axe from dropping at Disney Animation. And then, of course, like four or five months later, uh, Fievel comes out, American Tale, and gross is twice as much as this movie. And it becomes, I think, the first, A, the highest grossing non-Disney animated film in the States. And B, I think the first uh, Disney film to be outgrossed by a rival studio in its given sure. year. Right. It made way more. Right. If the release had been flipped, this movie might have been a death knell. Like it, it benefited from coming out first, overperforming. And the wheels got turning on the next wave of movies before Fievel came out and sort of made them eat the, their lunch. Now, let me just, before we talk about the movie more. Yes. I just want to say a few things about Ron Clements and John Musker, Please. who are the same age, both 67. Incredible. Similar names. They're Ron and John. They've got similar names. People, I feel like, often are like, is it John Clements and Ron Musker? Right. You know, like they, they flipped the first names. I did this last episode. Yes. Right. Um, or you thought you did it. Um, but but you actually had done okay. Who knows? You great. could tell me either way. Yes. Ron Clements. He's from Sioux City, Iowa. Okay. Mm. And he's worked as an animator for years. And he's been married to his wife, Tam- Tam- Tamara, Tamara, Jesus, since 1989. That's really all I got on him. Th- he that's, seems this just is like a point. nice guy. <laughs> yeah, they just look like nice grandpas. <laughs> Fran, you're going to want to hear this. John yep. Musker. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> He's Hello? from Chicago. He's from Chicago, Illinois. Okay, that's what I like to hear. Can we get a little more specific about where in Chicago, Illinois? I uh, no, but I can tell you that he's the <laughs> second of eight children in an well, Irish that, Catholic family. That's right. Okay, that sort of and the, does some geographical settling for me. Sure, in and and that his dad, Robert Musker, worked for over forty years at Illinois Bell Telephone. Hey, that's nice. I use I used to use the phone all the time back in Chicago. I think that's a lot of people don't know that we have those out there and we're using them all the time. That's huge. Thanks. Um, the thing that's the most interesting, and we'll talk about this a little bit next week, but I do think we this is the week to talk about. We're setting them up. Mm-hmm. Is that, yes, as you say, they sort of both get, they're both guys who work at Disney. They work on a lot of the projects you would have heard of, you know, Fox and the Hound, Black Cauldron, right? All that stuff. Yeah. They're both thrown onto this movie. Obviously, like you say, Clements is actually a Holmes fan so he's more right uh passionate Mm -hmm. about this you know whatever but while they're making this movie eisner and katzenberg hold the gong show right the famous gong show where they're like pitch us your ideas you know and it'll live or die right and and the idea was also like anyone at the company can pitch an idea like a janitor can come in and pitch an idea we're so desperate for ideas for our next wave of movies anyone can come in we'll gong them if it sucks but but you could potentially pitch the next Disney animation film. And Clements and Musker. No, I'm trying. I think it's Clements pitches. I want to get this exactly right. Clements pitches The Little Mermaid. He's mm-hmm. like Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. 
He gives a little pitch and Katzenberg is like, Splash just came out. You know, or no, Eisner is the one who rejects that. Like, you know, Splash just came out. We can't do a mermaid. And Clemens pitches Treasure Planet, a Mm -hmm. sci-fi Treasure Island movie, like which is his deepest passion project. Yes. So these are the two cornerstones of like the the career we'll talk about, right? Little Mermaid, which brings them success. Treasure Planet, which is their lowest moment, right? Like that's the sort of pillars, mm-hmm. right? Both rejected. Yes, yes, they had them in in the back pocket already this early. Yes, both rejected. Right, but but it is crazy to, and that's where they unite. Like Musker's, like I like those ideas, right? There, that's where they they. Their partnership forms. Katzenberg is like, all right, maybe work up a Little Mermaid treatment for me, and that's where it all happens. It's just, it is crazy to think. It's like it's really as, as little as that like dumb Gong Show thing. Yeah, I mean, this movie was just successful enough to let the Little right. Mermaid live, and it was like you know by a hair. The other thing that happens at this point, or roughly around this point, is uh, they they bring in. Um, why am I forgetting their names now? Uh, Schumacher, Patrick Schumacher, uh-huh. and the other guy who I'm forgetting, um, who kind of take over Disney animation directly overseeing it. Because it was vaguely right. uh, Roy Disney's domain, but he admitted that he didn't really have the talent to oversee it. He was just kind of like the connection to the past. And right. uh, Eisner said to him, like, you could use a Katzenberg. Uh, Roy E. Disney, right? He's the uh, right. He's Correct. the guy who's around. Yes. Okay. Um. So, just crazy to think. Without Little Mermaid, Disney as we know it does not exist. Modern Disney. No. Right. Fair to say. Hmm. I know. Uh, I sorry, know. The, Beauty and the, the guy's Beast. names. I just want to give credit here. I apologize. Peter Schneider is the one sure. guy. Thomas Schumacher is the other guy. They come from a theatrical background, and that's when the influence starts coming in on Little Mermaid of sort of the the Broadway musical sensibility being brought into these movies. Sorry, David, what were you saying? Nothing. I mean, that, that, no, I was basically done. I know Beast, Beauty and the Beast happens somewhat parallel to Little Mermaid, but that was also a movie that was made very quickly. I think I think Little Mermaid. Learn Little Mermaid is really the first thing yeah. that gets going after this. Where yes, and 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 that's you know that's why we now have, uh, you know, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Like, and <laughs> we should give thanks to the great mouse detective Basil of yes. Baker Street oh, for no. that. But don't but you think Peter Schneider comes on? I think in the early stages of this movie. And uh, uh, Schumacher comes on later and they're sort of tasked with like, you got to fix the culture around here. There was a lot of cynicism, I think, from the animators that like this is going to get shut down any day. These people in charge are, are bean counters. There's this notorious like all hands on deck meeting. They would do like 8 a.m. meetings with everybody where uh, Eisner and Katzenberg, with no previous experience in animation, would sort of chastise them on what they were doing correctly. And uh, yeah, I think Eisner, especially as a Paramount live action guy, is yeah. like, this movie's boring. Like, you know, is right. And he's like, this is slow. You need to jazz this up. Like, as if they could just right. like go and shoot some new scenes. Like, as if this is not this complicated process to make an animated movie. Right. And like the, the, um, burlesque number which we've already sort of yes. alluded to he wanted madonna to do it he wanted michael jackson yes. to do it and he wanted yeah, them bl- to do it after it had already been animated <laughs> michael jackson <laughs> is the one that i believe he first pitched and the, the the like thing i read is like his suggestion was met with an uncomfortable silence <laughs> and oh. eisner withdrew the idea <laughs> there's a lot of that uh, shit yeah so i mean uh Schneider's the guy who comes in who is sort of trying to, like, ease relations, right? Sure. He's kind of the go-between between the two groups, and he comes from a creative background. He's not a bean counter, and he's the one who really starts listening to what the animators want to do and, and opens up the gates for Little Mermaid to come next. Um, but this is the movie kind of stuck between those two pillars. Yes, there's that movie, um, Waking Sleeping Beauty, that yes. is... Uh 
uh, worth watching. It has a lot of, I feel like, some Schneider content. It's all about the Renaissance. But this is right. If you're talking about the quote-unquote Disney Renaissance, this often is not even included. This is the sort of weird bridge movie along with Oliver and Company where it's like kind of the start of it, but it's not, you know, the, the success isn't quite there yet. But I, it's kind Griffin, of the guarantor. Yeah. It's a bit of a guarantor. I saw this film in 1992 when it was re-released in mm. theaters. And mm. it was a fairly pivotal, I remember it fairly well. Like when I was watching this movie, I was like, oh, I remember like exact like frames of this thing. Like, you know, it's just that when you're a kid, that stuff kind of burns in your brain. Did you, I you must have been too young though. I'm assuming you did not see it in theaters. Well, Maybe. I mean, uh, my first movie I saw in theaters was The Jungle Book, which I think sure. was 91 or 92 for re-release. Right. I mean, I distinctly remember that even though you argue that there's no way I could remember that. You were very small. I was very small. I don't think I saw this in theaters. I think I saw this in video and I think it was one of those movies, uh, sort of like what I was saying to Fran, where I didn't, realize it existed for a while it would feel uh, right, like only exactly. when the re-release came about they would sort of act like and yes the great mouse detective it's always been here i remember very clearly and it's again you know that just one of those kid memories where you just remember a thing that's uh, on its face mundane like being on the bus the bus that went down broadway um the m1 probably whatever that bus is going to the movie theater and my dad trying to explain to me what sherlock holmes was to set me up for this movie. This was my question was like, did you have any frame of reference for Sherlock Holmes? If I did, it would probably begin and end with like, it's a man who's a detective. Like, I don't think so. Like, I think he was trying to be like, just so you know, like he lives on Baker Street. He has an assistant called Watson. Like y y this movie is referencing all, you know, he's just the thing of where your parent is just trying to like prime you for some of the world that you're about to enter when you're very small. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I'm trying to figure out if this was my introduction to Sherlock Holmes. See, I, I feel like I probably saw it late enough that I understood who Sherlock Holmes was, at least as like a cultural meme. But it is interesting how this movie doesn't operate like um, Robin Hood, say, where it's like, oh, it's a retelling of this classic right. character yep. with animals this is very much like a riff on sherlock holmes like a lot of its potency comes from you understanding the way the real sherlock holmes works yes it's it's jokes for fans right the way basil is introduced no one ever really slows down and is like so here's the deal with this guy and here's why he acts this way you just right. kind of have to be like right that's how sherlock holmes behaves he's like rude he's crazy kind of, his landlady yeah, hates him place. right He's got his violin. I think my introduction to Sherlock Holmes, honestly, was Wishbone. That's the other thing I'm sort of uh, oh, that's, mapping onto my hmm. youth. Is I feel like I remember Wishbone in the detective outfit pre this movie. Right. I mean, when you're watching this, you are like, I mean, and this is a, the coldest take possible. You're like, yeah, I mean, Sherlock Holmes. It, it, it It's a formula that always works. Like... I can see why they fucking reboot this every five years, right? Like, yeah, he's bossy. The other guy's befuddled. There's a mystery to solve. Like, this this is clicking, like, right away. I get it. Yeah, he's mean, but then he's kind of nice at the end. I it mean, always it's hits. basically what, like, all television is, right? Yeah. But there, there's something pointedly more adult about him as a character, which I think we're sort of getting at, where it's like, right. you can take a character like Robin Hood and, like, smooth out the edges and just make him heroic. But there's something kind of more in, innately hard-edged about Holmes, especially the fact that he's dealing with, like, real crimes, you know, that in order right. for the character to murder. function, he has to be preventing murder from happening, you know, or at least trying to find justice for it. He tests bullets that were fired from guns. You know, that's that's a little real. This movie has like cigarette smoke and shit. Disney would never allow any of that. This movie makes smoking look so cool. I'll just I'll say that. That's yeah. OK, though. Only for animals. I wonder if it has the disclaimer on it because like now Disney Plus, it feels like will more often they won't put it before the movie, but they'll put it on the page. Yeah, it has like a content, you know, it's yeah. like contains depiction of smoking or whatever, you know, they like, should you know. say in the smoking looks cool. <laughs> yeah, make make smoking look rad. Uh, rad again. Um, rad again. 
Um, yes. What I was going to say, though, I, I don't know if any of you remember this. I was such a big Looney Tunes kid, but there was like this sub genre of Looney Tunes that were animals that behave like classic comedians or sitcoms or comedy duos. Like there was like a cat Abbott and Costello and there was a couple of cartoons that was like the Jack Benny program with yeah, mice. This, is the, this rings of fame fell, but it was one, it would have been one of those things where I saw it where I was like, I don't get what this is. Like, well, that's what I was going to equate it to. Like they were things like, like right. and also how Peter Laurie would be in Looney Tunes. Yes. Yes. And you're just like, who is this guy? And my dad or mom would be like, Oh, that's like an actor who was like famous when right. this was made. Like, but, but I can't explain. Yes, yeah, these ones were so hyper specific because it would be like, oh, it's a mouse version of the honeymooners, and every character dynamic is the same, and it's just mapped onto a small hole in a house, you know, where they all live. The Jack Benny one I remember in particular, where it's like watching as a child and going, like, these are specific references. There's something I'm supposed to be getting when he's calling for Rochester that is not apparent. And this has the same relationship. I know it's based on a book, but the fact that it literally starts with like, here's the address, here's the silhouette in the window, and then we sort of go down and here in the bottom in the hole is the mouse equivalents of the real characters you're used to usually following. Like it, from right. even watching as a child, you're made very aware that there's some odd like they aren't the real thing. There's some reason yes, they right. keep on refocusing yeah. attention on this guy upstairs who we're not following. Now I'm really remembering also the Peter Laurie thing where I had the experience like seeing Casablanca the first time where I'm like, that's Peter Laurie from the from Looney Tunes. Like They got the Looney Tunes guy. It's, it's the real man, right? It was so surreal to see it backwards. Man, Tenet. All right. It's a real Tenet moment for me. Tenet. Knock it off. I haven't seen it yet. Look, wow. Fran, it'll open some of the right doors, maybe some of the wrong ones, too. Right. I mean, look, you haven't <laughs> seen it, but in another way, it's not a matter of have. It's a matter of when. No, I mean. yeah. <laughs> okay. In certain ways, you <laughs> have seen Tenet, Fran. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, The Great Mouse Detective, uh, I saw it in 92. I don't think I've seen it since then. It's not a movie we owned. You know, obviously we owned plenty of the disney's this one we didn't i assume you didn't either griff no i i watching it la uh, today i thought to myself i maybe have only seen this once before on video when i was seven same uh i threw this on and i texted you griff and i was just like it's obvious like you say this movie was made cheaply it's obvious that it's the cutting corn right you know like that they're, they're, they're really just trying to stretch their pennies you said your exact wording was this is like the cheapest Disney movie ever made and it makes all modern animation look like a toilet. <laughs> makes all modern and, animation look like a toilet. I'm and just then like, you why sent a picture of Olivia Flavisham and said, look how cool Olivia Flavisham I, is. I also got that. I also got fit check on Olivia Flavisham. She looks great. I, she she's fucking great. serving this eight-year-old <laughs> Scottish mouse in a beret. Uh, she's just barging in, and I'm like, this woman is incredible. I she's mean, the girl. best. She's a girl. She's, she's so good. She's And I loved her as a kid when I finally saw it. I was like, Radigan, move over. There's a nice little girl. <laughs> and to read about the production of this movie where they were like, that character was almost was a grown-up initially. Right, it was supposed to be a classic. love interest. For right, Basil. classic Sherlock Holmes. Right, you know, right. Yeah. She's got a, she's a damsel. And they were like, she should be a kid so that the kids have someone to relate to. Good note. Yeah. Like, who, who, who comes note. in and is like, hey, have you noticed there are no child characters in this children's movie? Like, maybe this is going to be a little weird. You've got a doctor who just like came over from Afghanistan. Right. It would be crazy to have a children's movie where it's like a detective, a surgeon and a professor. And be like, right. get invested in this. <laughs> but I guess, like, I mean, The Rescuers is kind of like that. I mean, they'd sort of it made is. this mistake a couple times recently. Did they have the character do cocaine in this movie and they ended up cutting oh, it out? Yeah. You know, he injects it right in there. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. sure. You know. That's what I thought. <laughs> That's another thing we should mention is this movie is like 72 minutes without credits. They just like yeah. whittled it down to the bone. Hell yeah. That was the other thing. I was like, this thing's going to be over. This is like an episode of a Netflix show that's a little long. 
<laughs> you know, this is like when you 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 queue up an episode of fucking Godless and you're like, oh god, this one's over an hour. Like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, is there no pr- quality control but- Netflix? If you read yes. the like Sherlock Holmes books, though, those are also extremely straightforward books. Yes. And like canonically, those are just like very simplistic, very in and out. Here's the premise. They solve it. They move on. Um, right. Apart from like Hound of the Baskervilles, which is longer and not as good, in my opinion. Like the, the novel length ones, I often don't didn't like as much. I liked the stories. Like the, Yeah, the little ones yeah. are good. And now it's like now we stretch Sherlock Holmes out into like a two and a half hour Two and a half hour thing. Well, he's got to be a boxer, you know. And Nola on. Holmes is like two hours and twenty minutes. Is it? It's pretty I long. I like it though. Enola. That's sort of my that's my crazy take. Did you see that thing where Robert Downey Jr. did an interview recently, and they asked him about Sherlock Holmes three, and like that movie had been in stasis for a while, and then they announced Dexter Fletcher, and it seemed like it was like getting ready to go soon, and he was like, "COVID right. has given us the opportunity to step back and really examine it and realize there's not an interconnected mystery cinematic universe out there. Oh, there should dark be Sherlock. a mystery verse, a mystery verse, <laughs> dark dark uh, uh, Holmes." Oh God! Wait, wait. What studio has Sherlock Holmes? Warner People Brothers. Tell me. Well, yeah, That's, Warner Brothers. So I AT&T. guess you could have a magnifying glass go over the logo. I'm trying <laughs> yeah. to think of how you can mess with the logo to 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 demonstrate the universe. But like motherfucker, mystery verse. What bullshit are you talking about? <laughs> it's are you telling Sherlock me? Holmes. The, that's the franchise. The franchise is Sherlock Holmes, and he was like, "We were wondering, what if we could make movies that are mysteries without Sherlock right. Holmes?" <laughs> No, he just needs to solve a mystery. Why is he making everything so complicated? Robert Downey Jr. is like Steph Curry. It's like he <laughs> he just need, you give him fucking anything and you're like, oh, my God, this guy is a, so annoying and charming. Like he can do anything. And he seems to be like willfully just like, how do I make this so difficult for anyone to like me anymore? Like that's his post Marvel fucking plan is do little like i'm gonna do a welsh accent and i'm gonna make you know make the movie as dog shit as possible i'm gonna add notes every five seconds the dragon should fart more whatever i, I think i'm so mad at him act anymore i just get right. the sense that he's over it i mean he, look here's the exact quote at this point we really feel that there is not a mystery verse built out anywhere and conan doyle is the definitive voice in that arena i think to this day so Who to me, why do a first? third movie? He's right. So, why, so to me, why do a third He's movie right. if you're not going to be able to spin off into some real gems of diversity and other Absolutely. times and elements? Mystery we think there's an opportunity universe. to build it out more. Spin off characters from a third movie to see what's going on in the television landscape, to see what Warner Media is trying to build out, things with HBO and HBO Max. Or, That's right. you know, just make a third movie with that character that people like. Why don't they just unite all the various active Holmes, Holmes and Watson combos like rope in mm. elementary rope in Enola. Right. Like right. they should oh, like, God they keep doing it. the Spider-Man three sort of announcements of bringing, yeah. <laughs> bringing all those people back, bring in all the other, you know, elementary verse to the Sherlock verse. You do a Sherlock verse verse. You bring in Cumberbatch, you bring in Cavill, uh, who is, I believe, right. It's Henry. Cavill oh yeah. Plays oh yeah. Him, and, and you won't yes. believe what his take on the character is. <laughs> Swole? I think that's hot and boring. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Henry Cavill, I love you. He's good. His take is that Ro- Sherlock Holmes is honorable. Look, I've come that's around different. to Henry Cavill. What can I say? Yeah. Like, I think he's a good actor. This is the world we live in. But Robert Downey Jr. makes a Sherlock Holmes 3. It makes $600 million at the worldwide box office. Boring. What if you made a mystery verse movie? You pay Cumberbatch 20 million. You pay Cavill 10, right? You know, let's jack the bucket budget up on this thing. It'll make 800 million. You know, like, it's like, who cares? Who cares? If you made a Sherlock Holmes movie, it would make money. People would go see it. All they want to do is be distracted. The world is annoying. You just want to go sit down and watch you solve a mystery, you jerk. 
also I'm this so like mad. mystery verse bullshit. It's like we have an opportunity here to corner the market on mysteries. And I'm like, I feel like that's what Ryan Johnson has done now. Just making a mystery movie that people liked. Like Benoit Blanc is cool, but it's not like if they announced he's doing a new mystery movie with a different director, people would protest. Whereas Sherlock <laughs> Holmes, the only thing going for it there is the idea of that guy playing that character. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. But that's yes. the whole thing with Knives Out is Brian Johnson's like, what if I just did like a movie where there's a mystery and there's right. a detective and you solve it? And people are like, I, I don't know. how. I mean, this is insane. You're what an alchemist. This? Where like, did this how come, did you come up with this? And it's like, <laughs> he did a fucking mystery movie. It was good. It had a mystery. You know, you felt satisfied. There were suspects. Like, yeah. And they're like, no, we got to make 10 of these right now. You are. Oh, boy. We're putting the golden handcuffs on you, buddy. It's so crazy. And I love Knives Out. Me too. But mystery is one of those uh, genres that is pretty budget friendly because you're just like you just need uh, a, a good hook. You need like a well-written script and a capable cast of actors. It doesn't need set pieces. That's the other thing. The fucking Poirot franchise is oh, also God, humming right. along. Oh, God. What if there was a death on the Nile, Fran? Who has that? Is Did it already come out? Is it coming Disney, out? Disney has it because they bought Fox. It has not come out. They decided not to release two Kenneth Branagh movies to nobody in the same calendar year. That'd be too weird. That's yeah. a so shame. It'll, it'll come out next September. We're Thank all going to be there. I'm going to rent a fucking boat <laughs> on the Nile. and We're all going to fucking <laughs> watch that movie on it. And it's going to be great. I would love to watch a movie like on a riverboat. That seems nice. Yes. Exactly. Ben, I didn't, you would I didn't love see a riverboat. One, but. Oh, absolutely. You have big riverboat energy. Can yeah. we gamble too before? We have to. Right, uh, the first one is all right. The first one is all right. I think I would Looks like it. Looks good. I think you it's would like it. It's pretty good. It, this is the thing. Even I would say that movie is probably objectively not that great. And it's very watchable because it's a fun mystery with character. You know, like this is this is what I'm saying. This is foolproof. Who gives this a movie, shit? The Great right. Mouse Detective, is fucking 72 minutes long. It's great. It just, yeah. just solves a little mystery. Do you think there's a mystery? Uh, I mean, it's like, you know, to f- figure out how to stop it. Sure. It's not sure. so much a figure out what the plan is movie. I kept wondering what it's up with the robot, because I wasn't sure what the purpose of it was. But we find I out mean, eventually. This movie also, right, when we should talk about this, and Fran and I, we were talking about this, like, right, it is also like <laughs> us. Like, it's like everyone has a mouse version of themselves. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Living a parallel yes. life. <laughs> yeah. Yes, because I think one of the, one of the great uh, jokes right, of the movie yeah. is that you see, you know, human but cartoon Sherlock Holmes and you get a brief glimpse, mm-hmm. glimpse of, like, human, right. the queen. So... Yeah, we they're all human doubles. the queen. We love her. Human human they're cartoon tethers. the queen. Right. This is a movie about mouse tethers. And like when I was a kid, I think my dad's trying to tell me, like, okay, Sherlock Holmes is a famous detective. But if you watch this movie, you're like, I guess Sherlock Holmes is a famous violinist. Like, that's all you see of him. <laughs> right. Playing he the, loves violin the violin in the window. Yeah. Right. Bring bring. Another call. Click. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. It's Mickey Mouse. Of course it is. Oh, hi, David. I mean, I guess we're talking about a film from the House of Mouse. That would be your house. A film about a mouse. It's a film from the House of Mouse about other mice. I'm trying to just That's show true. support. That's true. But you weren't in it. Were you mad about that? Well, no, no, of course not. I wanted to hire some other mouse fans. It's hard for mice to get acting work in Hollywood. I thought it was good to set up a project to help others. Representation matters, David. Do you disagree? Not at all. But is that why you're calling in today? No, I'm calling in because of my floppy penis. Ho ho! Yeah, you've got erectile dysfunction. I mean, that's a it's an issue guys dread, but like it's pretty normal. I I, I think by age forty, almost forty percent of men struggle with ED. So you're not alone, Mickey. No, no I, I'm almost a hundred. Yeah, you're very old. That's true. I, I'm so old I should be in public domain, but Disney lawyers keep on finding loopholes. Ho ho! Uh, that's interesting. I, I wish um, I could find a loophole, but my dick's too floppy. 
Well, how about Hims? Because they're going to connect you with licensed medical professionals online to see a prescription treatment is right for you. Okay, it's it's real science. It's real solutions to ED. Oh, uh-huh. yes. You're going to be connected to a licensed medical professional online who can prescribe FDA-approved prescription medication to treat ED. It's the same active ingredient as that expensive little pill without the expensive price tag. I, I'm glad that uh, I can uh, uh, get the prescription without going to a doctor's office because the only doctor we have within coverage at Disney is Doc McStuffins. And I think that's illegal. No, that's the thing. It, it can be a little awkward and it would cost hundreds of bucks if you went through a doctor or a pharmacy. His HIMSS makes it simple and affordable. There's no embarrassing conversations, no expensive appointments. You answer a few questions online about your medical history. A provider reviews it. And if approved, the medication is shipped directly to your door in discreet packaging and shipping is free. There's no more searching online for answers to questions about ED or sexual wellness. Go to your HIMSS account, ask a medical professional uh, you can trust. Why well, live with ED? And the solution is so simple, Mickey. I no, they, I have no excuses anymore. Minnie's gonna be thrilled. All right, try Hims today by starting out with a free online visit. Go to forhims.com slash blank for your free visit. That's forhims.com slash blank. F O R H I M S dot com slash blank. Prescription products are subject to medical provider approval and require an online consultation with a medical provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. See website for full details and safety information. Remember, that's forhims.com slash blank. Can't wait to fix my penis. I'm so excited for you, Mickey. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Fran, I want to roll back the tape for a second. When we were talking about uh, when we saw this movie for the first time, did I hear mm. you say that you think you have only seen it once in full before this podcast? Yes. I mean, I was I was trying to think um, because our our system of sort of like movie purchasing when I was a kid was we would rent something that I hadn't seen, you know, before we would commit to buying it. And I think I got this from the library and watched it and was like, I don't I don't really like this outside of the Radigan song. And so therefore never had it in my possession again until this past week. So you you have disproportionately watched the Radigan song probably hundreds of times more than Easily. you've seen the film at large. Yeah. Easily hundreds of times that, I mean, the, also just that sing along tape. I think I watched more than the rest of them, but you know, I would say probably once a month in my adult life, I do watch world's greatest criminal mind on youtube.com. Wow. Okay. And what is it about the song Fran? Oh, I don't even know anymore at this point. I think it, you know, ticks some kind of comfort box as a sure. kid. I think I sort of liked it's like swoopy performativeness. I loved all the I li- I always really liked sort of villain um layers Same. Same. in mm. in the movies and I loved seeing like piles of jewels. Um and I <laughs> love course. and I love 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 the the aesthetics of the champagne fountain and I do have a very there is some childhood story about me. I must have learned what champagne was through this movie because I was I'm sure I was like, what is pink and comes out of a fountain? I have to know what this is. And I think my parents are like, that's champagne. Uh, it's what adults drink. And there is a sort of famous story about me bringing a plastic cup to my grandfather and being like, do you want some champagne? Like as a as like a play thing. And he was like, why does Francis know what champagne is? And I was like four <laughs> or five or something like that. So. Not only am I sort of familiar with the Holmes canon from this, but also uh, champagne, the beverage. And I only learned it was Vincent Price probably like five or six years ago, despite having seen it probably 200 times by that point. A a good singer. Yeah, he's great. great. And having this whole separate context for Price and then having to like merge them together in my squishy, smooth adult brain. I I want to. All right. I found the, the tape. Griffin, and I'm sure you had this one too. I also own some of these tapes. Mm-hmm. It was the Be Our Guest tape. Amazing okay. track list. All, Here are the all 10 hits. songs. Be Our Guest. Good. Spoonful of Sugar. Good. From Mary Poppins. Little Wooden Head from Pinocchio, mm. which is, um, yeah, yeah, sort of a weird. Bella Maybe that's Note a skip. Tape from Lady and the Tramp. Good. Heffalumps and Woozles, as Fran mentioned. Beauty Slaps. and the Beast title song. World's Grace Criminal Mind coming in at the seventh slot. Chim Chimmery, we're back to Poppins. Once Upon a Dream from Sleeping Beauty. And then we're going to take us out with a reprise to be our guest. Wow. So good. I also really love Once Upon a Dream. That's, a, a, dream's that's a beautiful song. It's Tchaikovsky. Do you know that? 
that movie is so fantastic. It's so good. Maybe my favorite of all all the animated. It might ones. be mine too. It is kind of a weird thing when you think about it, like that you could go out and buy a video of an entire movie. Like if you're begging your parents to buy you a new VHS, right? Or you can watch like a 45 minute YouTube compilation. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yes. It was, it was YouTube on VHS basically. Right. They had this robust line of VHS supercuts. Like now with a kid, you probably just, right. You throw on some YouTube playlist of, Disney songs. But I wonder if the organization of these tapes has also completely like ruined how I listen to music and that now I make playlists that are say 70% one album and then just a bunch of other random songs that Hmm. I don't want to listen to the full album of. I really do feel like the sort of layout of these videos was weirdly influential in how I just sort of, I don't know, listen to music. Yeah, there's a a sort of fat cutting, like all, all killer, no filler. (laughs) <laughs> um yes mm-hmm. right but anchored with like you want to watch like 50 percent of this one thing and then we'll throw in some other potpourri for good measure yeah totally well i remember also like when disney plus came out one of my students was like do you have disney plus and i didn't have it yet at that point and she was like how are you gonna watch mulan every day which is a very weird question but one that i will remember forever and i was like i don't need to watch mulan every day i can go to i can go and just watch the one song i want to see uh that it that i've been completely able to like divorce these from the like whole of the motion picture i think because i watched so many of these like song compilations growing up But also, I mean, I do think like we're, you know, we're currently living in the Great Depression, right? The time before there are 10 different TV shows based on every single character on Disney Plus when they still have a pretty finite uh, amount of content on there, right? Mm -hmm. Like so much of I feel like the discourse around the wild success of Disney Plus in terms of all the new streaming services and how good their subscriber numbers have been relative to how little they have on there, uh, right. how much more shallow their catalog is. Um, it is just, I think, that exact thing, Fran, of just like, I'm going to pay my Disney Plus tax every month because I want to know, like a security blanket, that I can watch Mulan every day. The Mushu is there for me. <laughs> right. Like, when I open up, like, a Netflix or Hulu, I'm going like, hmm, what what do I want to see? What haven't I gone around to? When I open up Disney+, Plus, it's very specifically, like, I'm in a mood, or it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I can't sleep, and I'm looking for sort of, like, the serotonin rush I used to get from putting on one of those VHSs for the hundredth time. Yes. Totally. Totally. And this, like... It's it's somewhat odd to watch this movie and kind of uh, focus on it just as its own thing and not as not its function in that kind of way. Like there's there's something so calming about putting this movie on just because it still has that like classic Disney feeling and it triggers some sense of like watching a VHS while your parents are eating dinner or something. Absolutely. Right. It's just a tape they put on and then it's bedtime or bath time or whatever. And they turn it off. Yeah. Even though you're like 35 minutes in. Right. Like just that. <laughs> right. that, that, that That's a real childhood thing that I sort of weirdly miss. Um, and like maybe just my my eyes are not smart enough to sort of I mean, I think now I can recognize cheap animation or something more thrown together than something else. But I was like, this is beautiful. This looks great. It looks great. Oh, th- um, that's the thing. I mean, it's 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 not cheap animation. It's like this is very much a last stand movie where they're trying to uh, uh, cut the budget as much as possible. And these animators are fighting to make the film look as robust as they can. And there are certain cheats they do in individual moments to work around it. But a lot of the budget cuts were just this movie being trim like and and fast you know, and, and zero fat. Um, and it also is just like, I think they made up for the budget cuts in just sort of sweat 
and blood and tears. And there's so much personality and feeling in the animation at every moment. They're like cramming as many little behavioral gags as they can. There's the early one with the gun where he's like looking at the gun and he throws it over. And then they like there's this weird back and forth with the gun that that isn't has nothing to do with the dialogue. And I just got the sense of like these animators being assigned individual scenes and going like, I know my job is just to animate a two mouse conversation, but I'm going to try to fit as much into every second on screen as I possibly can. Like what pieces of business can I come up with? How much can I have them interact with in their environment? These guys are wondering if they're ever going to get to work on a movie ever again to some degree. I got to say that whole opening sequence, which is, the start of the movie, The Grey Mouse Detective, is my favorite part. The Radigan stuff is obviously sort of great and kind of stands on its own. And it's kind of the classic Disney thing of, oh, the villain is more exciting than the heroes a lot. Right, you know, like, villain song is always good, right, all that. But this is sort of credited as being the start of the villain song thing, that this was the first time where they were like, the villain's really popping, the villain songs are the ones that people like, and that starts the recentering, which you see, like, from Little Mermaid, they understand the power of Ursula. Right. Villain villain needs a big song, big arc onto themselves. And, and yes. that these characters can be fun, not just scary, but there can also they can be comedic resources, you know? Yeah. And that they could find love even. With, <laughs> with someone offer? With someone like me, another professor, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> just um, could be could be easy. So and you mm-hmm. know, I mean, thinking of the holiday, thinking of a past Rand episodes, Jack Black could play Radigan now if he did a, you know, remake. Hmm. Uh, you no, know, it's a different he's, thing. He's so gentle. Yeah, know, your tweet, Fran, was was Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy. I always so say always Hardy playing, yeah. because that feels like the live action Disney sort of Mad Libs that yeah, they would no, do. You're right. You're right. Um, you're right. It seems like such an obvious Hardy type to me. You're totally right. I mean, this is this. They should just do Walt Disney presents the Peaky Blinders, like with mice or whatever. God, I would l- go wild for that. <laughs> that oh. would be so good. I was when you were uh, saying like when you log on to um, Disney Plus as sort of like a comfort thing. I was like, oh well, like when I log on to Netflix, all of my still watchings are sort of like half watched Peaky Blinders episodes where mm. I just want to rewatch like Tom Hardy only compilations. Uh, so that's maybe my sort of use of Netflix he, at this he point. He plays but, a rabbi, correct? Yeah, he's a, I Ugh. think he's an Orthodox Jewish mobster. He's making rum and bread. His name is Alfie Solomons. If you've ever wanted to hear Tom Hardy say Shalom so many times. <laughs> Always. Peaky Blinders seasons two through four are the ones for you. Uh, can I throw something out quickly? Hmm. Please. Uh, squeaky Blinders. Hey. <laughs> the, I would really love this. Oh my god. So but as a uh, the, the opening sequence, uh mm-hmm. foggy London town, cobblestones, little oh, Olivia Flavisham. How do you know yeah. that? They say it, right? Don't they say oh, like okay. 18, okay. Okay. 97 yeah, yeah, yeah. or No, you're right. Or they they, you're they right, do ben. say there's even a narrator, right? There's a Watson and uh, whatever his name is, Dawson is narrating, right? Correct. Dawson is narrating. He's like it's the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. He's like, you know, he's doing a whole thing. And little you know, the the kidnapping of Olivia's father obviously, but the the whole early sequence where both she and Dawson are meeting Basil at the same time and he's doing all his business and he's firing the gun. He's being chaotic, he's as we would say in modern parlance. Being chaotic and figuring out where they're all from and the um, landlady is flustered and all this stuff. Is, is I, I, What I love about this kind of animation, it, it's so alive. It's just wall-to-wall gags. It's wall-to-wall gags. It's wall-to-wall, like, kind of behavioral fun. There's also something to... This is that tail end of animation being shot on film. And I do think there's some weird psychological effect to... Because, like, by the time you get to Beauty and the Beast, it's it's caps. It's all being done on computers. They, you know, they draft it by hand, but then they scan it in, and it's all kind of painted and colored on computer. 
and it looks uh, just kind of incredibly clean. Whereas watching this, yes. you can still tell the the kind of um, there's the tactility of the layers that like right. the background is painted an entirely different style from right. the I characters who are cell animated. Uh, there's a distance between the two frames. You have shots with the multiplane camera, which is when they do that sort of trick to make it look like there's depth in the animation by having a couple different layers of background so the camera can like move through a space and shit like that. I um, love that and stuff. it makes you so much more aware of the magic act of like, this is unbelievable. Like, how is it possible that you can draw a bunch of shit and trick the brain into thinking it's moving? Um, but I also think... You talk about all that business at the beginning. They're showing off all the things they can do. The more he moves, the more the fabric is moving around them, right? All the objects in their space. And in hand-drawn animation, you don't have physics simulators. I mean, at this point, like, Pixar can animate something, and the character is wearing a scarf, and the scarf essentially has artificial intelligence, Right. The yes. scarf knows how to follow the movement of whatever is right. going on. And then you can finesse it a little bit. It's been programmed to understand what it is as a scarf and what right. the environment is and all that. Right. But when you're seeing like Basil running back and forth, doing all this business, moving around and his bathrobe is flapping all over the place, you know, or his, uh, his nightgown or whatever it is, uh, it does it's it's show off shit that is just kind of still stunning to watch um it all rules i i like basil i think he's fun i know radigan yeah, I is a the secret guy. star of this movie but i think basil's a cool dude i like i like basil basil's just great um played by barry ingram i like uh, the Watson character, whatever the hell his name is. He's good. Dawson. He's great. I like when he's wearing a crop top at the club. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. That's a good I like look. to it's see like a pirate body. vibe, though, too. Well, I, yeah. I thought he looked like Smee. My, uh, a lot of my queer friends and I are very obsessed with Smee core, and when we sort of accidentally dress up like Smee, uh, <laughs> and that to me was a very Smee core outfit. <laughs> Just based on someone sent someone an outfit being like, do I look cute tonight? And some, being like, you look like Smee, but okay. <laughs> Sometimes you look like Smee. Smee is a wild character when you think about it. What's wild about him? Well, it's like, you know, Peter Pan has this hated enemy, Captain Hook. He's a murderous pirate with a hook hand. He captains a ship filled with murderous pirates who are bad. Also, there's this kind of fun <laughs> old guy. Yeah, right, yeah. also there's Smee. <laughs> it's, it's Disney Smee in particular who's weird because I feel like other depictions of Smee make him more of like a complicit right-hand man, even if he's funny. And Disney yes. Smee is like an innocent. In Disney, mm -hmm. in the Disney one, he is fully an innocent, whereas right, usually he's just an idiot. Like he's right. uh, a, a, a nincompoop, but he is he's an incompetent happy to villain. murder. Right, yes, right. yes. Uh, I mean, Hoskins as Smee, I, for, you know, the hook has its flaws, but Hoskins as Smee is just absolutely it was good casting. Yeah. fucking murdering it. <laughs> um, God, but let's, Hoskins I mean, as Smee. Yes, the basic ahead, setup of this movie is uh, Olivia Flaversham's father, who is a toy maker, is kidnapped so that he can make a replica queen uh, so that uh, Radigan can displace the queen and take over as the ruler of, of Mouse London. Correct. Correct. Yes, uh, it's there's there's sort of two things going on. One, he wants to rule Mousedom in London. Mm -hmm. England, whatever, I guess. I don't, I don't know how far her kingdom reigns. Queen uh, Mastoria. Yeah. Right. Two, he is insistent that he is a mouse, despite obviously being a rat and literally being called Radigan. Yeah. And we never dig into the details of, like, why mice and rats are not common citizens. Like, what what's so terrible about being a rat? Except, I guess, just that they're big and different. But he doesn't want to be a rat. I'm sure he had to fight that reputation as he worked his way up in academia. You know, it can be a really right. sore point for a lot of a lot of creatures. Is there a mouse version of you, David? I'm oh, sure there yeah. Is. Yeah. The movie would imply. Yeah, there's a little mouse version of me. And he had to move to England when I moved to England. He had to move back. Right. Like, you know, he's uprooting his whole fucking life. Yeah. You do want to dig into the fact like when. uh 
uh, Dawson talks about uh, being in Afghanistan, you're like, <laughs> was there a little mouse war that was running parallel to the big human war? That's what I want to know. He's he's done surgery. That's crazy. He's done to me. surgery. But I guess a mouse could do surgery. Why not? They're nimble. Yeah, they got little hands. They carry over almost nothing from the book. Like almost everything yes. was changed from the original book aside from the character names. Um, right. And Radigan was in the book series a mouse who is misidentified as a rat. And then they decide to flip oh. it to he's a rat who desperately wants to be seen as a mouse, which yes. works much better as like a comic Disney villain sort of like uh, um, stem, you know? Yeah, a lot uh, of the Disney yes. villains are sort of like trying to belong in their own, you know, fucked up way. Right. The, the fundamental rejection of what they are, the sort of emperor's new clothes, I demand that I remake myself and be seen as this. Yeah. Absolutely. All this stuff gets set up incredibly quickly, and then you're mostly just watching this fun trio uh, of Olivia right. and Dawson and Basil, and then uh, shortly they get teamed up as well with Sherlock Holmes' dog, which is another odd aspect. Of the, like right. You have this one character who's kind of passing back and forth yeah. between the two An worlds. ambassador between the worlds, <laughs> Toby. Much like the dog in Toy Story. He, he is yeah. in both worlds. I right. thought a lot about Toy Story 4 during the big set piece at the, at the toy. Are they at a toy store in this? That's yeah, where, that's where Fidget's stealing, stealing the uniforms. It reminded me a lot of that big sort uh, of Toy Story 4 ending. Fidget's bad, but he's great. Come on. Yeah, oh, I was fun. really sure. I was so sure that your Zoom background was going to be Fidget, Ben. Well, Fidget is yeah, very I mean, Ben, but Ben went right. You went for another thing that you like. I went for I just like the big cat because the big cat mm, the big is just like cool. a fun device. She rocks, sort of girl boss vibes. Yeah, absolutely. Fidget's kind of like a bad dude, right? But he's got a great voice, and he's I I like his vibe. Candy Candido, that's the guy who plays Fidget, right? He's it, it's he's yeah. a classic voice actor. It's funny that Fidget is kind of entirely terrifying. Like, yeah, he's it's, just it's, really <laughs> scary. It's true. He's kind but of it, fucked up. Like, yeah, but it's kind of a flip on the usual dynamic these things have where it's like, okay, the main villain is a little more like straight evil and then they have a funny henchman sidekick. And here, like, Radigan is a little more buffoonish, you know? And, and uh, Fidget is just uh, straight up terrifying. Uh, Fidget also looks so similar to... Bartok from Anastasia. Yes. So similar to Bartok. But Bartok uh, is a friendly fellow. Yes. He's the one who's always like, hey, look, you know, Rasputin, I know we live in hell, but, uh, you know, why do you got to be so mean? You know, like he's always trying to chill Rasputin out. I was trying to find it. Maybe I just failed, but I was trying to find some sort of bridge between the two projects. If there was some animator on this who went on to Anastasia and, and ran the lead I mean, on that. But, but the design Fern are... Gully also has a fun bat. A fun oh, bat is, is similar to Mouse or whatever. Like, I guess they just think bats are cool. I mean, I bats know. are cool. Yeah, sure. Bats are His cool. His voice is so crazy. His voice is insane. They like, they were modulating him, right? No. I don't know. That seems like one of those classic just guys who can do A guy who can do voice. that? Yeah. That's so yeah. wild. But, but but like, it's also, it's not just, he's just got a lot going on. He has a purple sweater. He has a peg leg. Like he's he a does. very like busy character, yes. <laughs> like beyond just already he's kind being of a like bat. a pirate almost a little bit yeah. in his own way. Oh yeah. Uh, sorry. I'm looking at Candy Candido here. Uh, Candido's distinctive four octave speaking voice became familiar Ugh. to radio listeners and moviegoers speaking his lines in his normal tenor. He would suddenly adopt a high squeaky soprano and just as suddenly plunge into a gruff bass. Wow. Right, cool. There you go. His catchphrase was He's I'm feeling mighty low, which he would say on Jimmy Durante's radio show. Yeah, there's a better time for America, yeah. probably. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he's like one of those guys. You, you like the the fucking picture they have of him. He looks like like Robert De Niro. Like, look at him yeah. from like the '40s. Look at this like daguerreotype they have on Wikipedia. He anyway. looks like Rupert Bumpkin. Yes, he does. That's right. He looks like 
De Niro in The King of Comedy. Yes. Yeah. Oh. He's got the exact same energy. <laughs> wow. David. Yes. I'm going to ask you a really serious question. Shoot. Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? I can't imagine what about the, the world right now might make me uh, feel is a little there unhappy. Anything? Is it's... there anything that it feels like is limiting you from doing what you want to do in your life? Is there any sort of force? <laughs> something circumstantial. Right. Yeah, right. A force majeure, yeah. perhaps? <laughs> yeah, there's some stuff. Sure, it's tough to see people. It's tough to, uh, you know, feel normal, go outside without feeling a little stressed out. Or uh, a little at risk of dying. That's uh, that's a yeah, fun yeah. thing. Yeah, well, that's yeah, well, what, that's, what, yeah, that's what's generating the stress, well, exactly. I got, I got great news for you, David. Yeah. Uh, what's that? Better help can assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist in under 48 hours, David. That's amazing. That's that's, that's wonderful. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. Uh, okay, Jerry. Uh, I, 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 it is very good, though. There's uh, all kinds of expertise, which you might not have locally available. I know about that. You can do it worldwide. Log in anytime. Send a message to your counselor. I mean, you can do weekly video or phone sessions, too, of course. But, you know, there's a lot of it's very accessible. Yeah, look, you get uh, timely and thoughtful responses. You, you can schedule the, the video or phone sessions whenever you want so you don't have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. A waiting room that might be riddled with a virus. Uh, Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And, you know, it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Financial aid's available. And you can just find a really good therapeutic match. And it's easy. But if you don't like it, it's free to change counselors if needed. I mean, look, David, why should you believe us? Two jamokes hosting a podcast. Sure. Right? Maybe you need to hear some testimonials from their website, okay? H how about this one right here, okay? This woman said, being socially anxious, it means a lot that I'm most of the times looking forward to a conversation with her. That's that's huge, right? Rather than dreading or, you know, thinking of it as homework, right? Yeah. Yes, you can visit betterhelp.com slash check. That's better, H-E-L-P. And join the over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. So many people are using it that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Talk about job creation. And blank check listeners are going to get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash check. It's, a, it's such a good deal. You should repeat it one more time just for clarity. Blank check listeners can get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash check. Oh, the global pandemic. That was the circumstance you were talking about yes, earlier. Right. Okay, oh, I got yeah, it. Of yeah, course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of right. No, there's yeah, a horrible yeah, that one has been getting me down. pandemic. No, almost no end in sight. Okay. Great mouse detective. Right. So, right. Act one is is them doing the mystery. So the, the whole toy shop sequence. In my head, another formative thing for me at this age was the TV adaptation of the children's book Corduroy. I don't know if you guys remember Oh, Corduroy. yeah. The live action Corduroy? Absolutely. I remember the character. I didn't know there was a live action TV thing. It's not very good. I, I, I it's on YouTube and I like checked it out because I real because they're both set in toy shops, obviously, because mm -hmm. Corduroy mm -hmm. is a bear that comes to life in a toy shop. And I realized that I had just completely like bonded these two things in my mind. I must oh, have interesting. seen them oh. right at the same time. Because like when they break into the toy shop, they like go through the window. I was like, no, Corduroy does that. And I'm like, no, no, he doesn't. Corduroy doesn't yeah. do that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Very weird uh, observation by me. Not important. No, no. I think there is that kind of thing though, like as a kid where there's something eerie about a toy shop at night because it both yeah. feels like that's my fantasy and also it feels illicit. Like... To some degree, you're like, oh, it'd be so cool if I could sneak into a toy shop at night when there are no adults and I could play with whatever I wanted. And to another degree, it just feels off-putting. Well, and it's in that time uh, period yeah. also where every toy is so scary looking. The like, yes, oi, Mr. Yumi Dad dolls are all sort of like crashing down <laughs> on them and the like jack in the box, all that stuff. <laughs> Oi, Missy Yumi Dad is one of those click holes that just, you're like, I can't believe this one clung on, but it really did. <sighs> All right. Um, uh, yeah, there, so there's the toy shop sequence. But there's also, well, there's Radigan's song, which we talked mm -hmm. about. 
but <laughs> if people want to talk about it anymore. It's not like any other animated crush I ever had again. He really sort of stands alone. Um, my crushes in, in the Disney sphere were never sort of like the leads. It was always some weird side character, uh, and this sort of started that off. But Such the rest as? are all like... Well, the other yeah, big n- one that names. I talk about all the time is uh, the Bonnie Hunt voice spider in Bugs Life was huge for oh, me. Oh, she is so fucking hot. She's so hot and she's so nice. Uh, I could I mean, not agree with that more. Bonnie Hunt also just a just huge an crush. A plus plus great hot. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I, uh, Fran, yeah. I think that's a very underrated character. I also always choke up when she says, you did it, kid, at oh. the end of the movie. And then she it's starts so the nice. slow clap. Bugs Life rules. That's, a, that's another one of those movies I haven't seen since like. Peanuts. I really like Bugs Life. Griff, I feel like you and I sort of align on some of the like more forgotten Disney ones because we're also both big Lilo and Stitch guys. Huge, huge. Yeah. yeah. Lilo, Nani, Lilo Nani, Nani Stitch, from folks. Lily and Stitch is oh, also big for me. On. I also, yeah. I was rewatching Lilo and Stitch with my with my poet neighbors and we all had a meltdown about the <laughs> hammerhead shark looking <laughs> commander being really hot. <laughs> Oh, we were like, is this guy sort of, you know, himbo, himbo icon? Interesting. Fran used to live near some poets and I, I used, used to love hearing about the poets. I used to live around the corner from uh, f- four or five, depending on the time of year, uh, poets who are five to six years younger than me, which influenced the entire way in which I view the world now. Mm. <laughs> oh, boy. A bug's I life. do think, uh, we, though. Yeah. No, no. What, what, please, I'm not going to stop you from saying something about a Bug's Life. What were you going to say? No, I, I, I have, I have no. I want to watch it. I, I guess we can't do Lasseter anytime soon. No, though. we absolutely can't. We can't. So I guess <laughs> I should just watch it for my own. Yes. Uh, my own She's such a beautiful spider. She's so beautiful. <laughs> Madeline Kahn also in that movie. I mean, Madeline Kahn in general oh, is one yeah. of my all-time movie crushes. So her as yeah, uh, Gypsy the, the Moth, by yeah. extension. The spider in James and the Giant Peach also very beautiful, I feel, but doesn't have the Bonnie Hunt effect. That's a good call. I mean, she's Sarandon and she's French, so she's a little more standoffish. That's that's me knowing as a child that that's going to be a bigger obstacle for me. You know, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's too tough. That's too tough. I got to I got to go more and sort of in my line of sight. I just realized uh, the Julia Louis Dreyfus's character is also kind of hot in Bugs Life. Like all the bugs That's in Bugs Life are kind of hot. Hot bugs, because that was the thing. Ants was very much like these bugs are not going to be hot. But <laughs> Bugs Life yeah. didn't worry about that. Right, because you got like Sharon Stone and uh, Jennifer Lopez. Jennifer and Lopez, ants. but they just but look like ants. Very Sharon Stone is an ants. I never oh, saw yeah. ants. Dude, Ants, yeah. it's Woody Allen, Sharon Stone, Jennifer Lopez. Sylvester Sylvester I think Stallone. I just always stop reading after Allen, and then I didn't Gene realize. Gene Hackman. The cast okay. is so weird. Christopher Walken, uh, Jane Curtin, and Dan Aykroyd play a, a couple play of wasps, but they're they wasps. wasps. The bit right. is that they're wasps. Yep. But they're oh, I wasps. see. They're I see. Chip I see. And Muffy. Yes. Okay. And Paul Mazursky, of course, plays Woody Allen's ant psychiatrist. Oh, of course. Uh, and um, but that's not we can't talk about that because we now have to talk about <laughs> the scene in The Great Mouse Detective where they go to a nightclub and a mouse performs a sexy song, uh, a burlesque which, number. Yeah. yeah, yeah, whole number, right? With costume changes. Also, a character gets roofied. Roofied. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. And also, yes. I mean, as you know, you love the cat. Characters are fed to cats. There's death in this, like yes. all over the place. Disturbing. Truly. I love the cat, but it's 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 intense. It's heavy. And the, and the cat is based on Blofeld's cat from Bond, right? That's this whole right. other Big, weird element. Cat. Right. Right. But it's sort of the same breed. I mean, it, it does get into the weird shape of this movie that like Radigan has two songs. Then there's a song, yes. uh, an extended burlesque number. It's a Disney animated movie without real hero songs. They don't sing at all. And it's Henry Mancini. Right. This is his first animated film. It's got a very different vibe. The songs feel more adult, but you don't have any I want song. You don't have any hero like love songs. The songs right. are all at the weird corners of the story. They're not sort of the emotional linchpins of uh, audience uh, uh, surrogacy. 
And I think I feel like Oliver and Company, which comes next year, has a little the songs are a little more plotty, but there's no consistency, right? Because it's like there's a Huey Lewis song, there's a Billy Joel song, right? Like there's But that's like, the whole thing. Right. That's what it, right. it's what it's Eisner wanted. A, he was like, get me Ben Midler, sure. get me Billy Joel. Right. Right. Make them all feel modern. There's one that I have no memory of Oliver and Company. I don't all. know that oh. I've seen it in full. I'm learning in real right. time that there's a Billy Joel song. <laughs> Yeah, Billy Joel plays the artful Dodger. He is the voice of the character. He's the second lead of the movie. He's yeah. got the best song in the movie called Why Should I Worry? Uh, that movie yeah. is wow. co-written by James Mangold. Uh-huh. Yes. yes. I like yes. it. And Maybe I'm going to sure watch it's fun. it. It's also, it's another one of those Disney movies that's fucking 70 minutes long. Yeah. Yeah, that's so nice. It was also just kind of nice, this weird wilderness period where they just all sort of shrugged and went like, I don't know if we know what a Disney movie is anymore. Like, oh, maybe it's thing. a bunch of street dogs in New York City, or maybe it's mice in London solving mysteries. Right. But but they do know that, look, kids are going to see this thing. If there isn't a fucking song after 20 minutes, they're going to lose their minds. Like, we need something yeah. to just kind of break it up for little kids. So there are songs. The nightclub song is t- even at even as vague as it is, I would say is like too adult for most children, but that song is a banger. That song's amazing. It's a good song. Um and I almost wish it's a good song. more of these just had songs that were songs for song's sake, you know. Melissa Manchester, the performer of that song. Right. So Mancini wrote the song originally. Then Eisner was like, can we get Jackson? Can we get Madonna? And then they brought in Melissa Manchester because Melissa Manchester had become the first person to get nominated twice in one year. Best song at the Academy Awards. So uh, she performed to to at least. Oh, OK. Yeah, so think, but did yeah, she not yeah, write them as well? Like, Am I wrong about no, that? I don't think I mean, I mean, I didn't see any Oscar. Nom- it doesn't matter. Carry on. Carry okay. on. But she did the two songs, so he thought, oh, if we hire her, it'll be a crossover success. That was his weird yes. thing was Eisner was like, we need to have these songs chart on like the pop charts. And shortly after this, not immediately, but there was that weird Disney tradition of there was always the end credits version of the main song sung by like adult contemporary people. Right. That's more poppy. Right. 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 Totally. I'm like, is this Berl- is this song the streaming? Trailer. I want to listen to it. Oh, it might mm. be. Let's find mm. out. Oh, it's but on it is, there. Yeah, let me let has- me. It's crazy that a kids movie has a song called "Let Me Be Good to You." Let me be good to you. That's nuts. I'm sorry, Melissa Manchester. Melissa Manchester did write the song. David Mancini wrote one that was thrown out. There are only I, I three songs in the wrote- movie. I know she wrote this song. She did oh, not, oh, oh, however, but she did write, write the two the songs yes. that were nominated for Oscars. Those songs were just perf- she performed two different songs at the Oscars, the and Ice they Castle were song. "I'll Never Say Goodbye from the Promise" and "Through the Eyes of Love" theme song from Ice Castles. Yeah, which is a good a good memory of like sometimes even back in the day when cinema was thriving, the Oscars had shit song years. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we should talk about the um, the Big Ben sequence. Uh, right. Briefly before then, can we talk about how Radigan basically sets a jigsaw style, style like saw puzzle for? Oh yeah. <laughs> I was like, is he jigsaw? Yes. He wants to execute them through a Rube Goldberg machine. He's he's a little steampunky. Yeah. Even though he kidnaps an inventor, he still kind of has a steampunk thing going on. It's interesting that he, yeah, that he can do one, but not the other. But I think it speaks to his sort of academic mind that he's like, what's the most complicated way I can execute uh, these two guys? And it's putting them in a mousetrap with that, with a record that spins, that's tied to a string that, you know, lets a ball, yada, yada, yada. But they were supposed to get shot. His and own axed. record, by the way, friend. Yeah. His single. He pressed his own record. That's yeah. a huge flex. I was sort of like, I wonder what yeah. song he'll play. And then when it immediately went to him, I was like, why did I think it would just be a known song? Uh, am I misremembering or does he not go like, I thought of like the eight different ways I could kill you. And then I realized I'll do all of them at once. Like there's the overkill too. He's Jigsaw. Uh, yeah. 
He's Jigsaw. He is Jigsaw, he's right? J- he's got Jigsaw some went to grad thing. school. Yeah, Which yeah, yeah. is kind of Moriarty's vibe, too, I think, because he's always like, I can outthink you, Sherlock. Like, you know, Moriarty's not just going to go and walk up to Sherlock Holmes and, like, hit him over the head with a crowbar. Like, he wants to to, you know, defeat his mind. So I guess, you know, that's what's going on here. But, right? but he doesn't feel like as much of a mastermind as Moriarty. He does have a little bit no. more of the Bond villain thing in him. Like he feels like a combination of three or four different yeah. sorts of theatrical British villain archetypes. Right. I mean, like you like you say, he's he's much more self-conscious and, you know, he's got a lot of image issues. He's worried about being a rat. And mm. right, rather than design his own clockwork Queen Victoria, he just kidnaps a guy to do it for him. And a little lazy. And Freelancer. also he's so big that you know, his physicality yeah. is part of it. I think yeah, the physicality is a is a big part of uh why he is why he's not sort of intellectual type. Um he's too henchman y. He looks like right. a gangster, which is why it would be hardy, you know? He does. He does yeah. look like Al Capone on top of everything else that we're talking about. <laughs> it's a lot going on, Griffin. There's a lot going on. Uh should we should we talk about Big Ben cuz I mean yes, this of is of course. Yeah. Big Ben, Big This clock. was like it was their big marketing hook for this movie was we got CGI. Like Black Cauldron had used a little bit, but it was I mean pointedly designed because at this point Eisner still thought is CGI a way to make animation cheaper and faster, which it didn't really end up being the case. Um, But he wanted to forefront it. And so they have this sequence, which is entirely inspired by the Count of Cagliostro. Hell hell yeah, man. It's, I, look, I mean, maybe it's derivative or whatever. I I love just, and I think the CGI is cool. It looks so good. It looks great. I yeah, lo- I, like, I got so excited when it switched over. It's cause, kind of yeah. thrilling, right? Yeah. It's kind of thrilling. It feels a little bit like a, like a Wizard of Oz, like everything going into color moment. And it also kind of makes you feel frustrated at um, how quickly CGI became its own thing and overtook mm-hmm. the idea of the two mediums being able to blend together. Because it is so effective. I mean, that whole, the, I think it's two minutes in total. Um, and they right. talked a lot Very about brief. how they were doing a lot of it, like, in the dark. I mean, it was sort of, you'd have to eyeball it Sully style and hope that the two elements would line <laughs> up together. But, Sully um, style. You gotta, look, you got you gotta eyeball it. No, I um, understand. I just, so I still always default to Monsters, Inc., Oh, yeah, sure. which is really annoying for me anytime I want Sully gifts and I get 80 fucking John Goodman monsters. But Griffin, <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but you do you know when this film came out? Uh, 1986? Yeah, but do you know the month? Do I know the month? Did yeah, they do it in July? The they did this one in July, Griffin. I just wanted to <laughs> they point that did out. It in they, July. they eyeballed it and, you know, guess what? They fucking did it in July. I, I was just going to say... The, the end of this whole sequence where Radigan has gotten like trapped in the gears and then his clothes are shredded and he's on all four legs like running wild rabbit. He's going rap, yes. rap, rap, rap mode. Rules. Yeah, he goes, it's true. He goes rap mode. He's so scary. It's thrilling. <laughs> it's crazy that I used to be attracted to one and now I'm so afraid of them. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's like th- this is the kind of rat. If you saw a rat dress like this in your apartment, you might be less scared. <laughs> <laughs> a dapper, a dapper little gent. Yeah, he's got a, right. a long cigarette holder. He's like, "Hello." He All right. Like yeah, Vincent I mean, Price. I would like that. I would like that. That would be a much different year with rodents than I've had. Yeah, I've been having so many uh, mouse and rat nightmares. I don't know about you. Oh, uh, really? Like, I ha- I haven't had, I've had a lot of rodent issues in past apartments. I haven't had one in this apartment. I keep on waking up from a nightmare where I found a, a mouse or a rat. Are you in real life? Are you that alarmed by them or like have, or are they, are you growing more fearful of them in your dreams? I don't know if I'm that alarmed by them. There's always just that sort of like uh, paranoia when you see that kind of infestation in your home and then you're just constantly yeah, right. on guard, you know, like, are they going to pop out at any moment? This is what happened to me this summer and it like ruined my life. <laughs> 
It's yeah. the tip of the iceberg thing where you see one and you're like, are there 10? Like, are there a right. hundred? Like, well, because yeah. then right. when you talk to people about how you have one, someone is always like, well, it's never just one. It's never just right. one. Right. They love to say that. Did you guys, um, did you have a friend like who had a snake who would feed mice to it? Yes. Yes. Growing I, up? I, yes. I, yeah. I, my that roommate, was always uh, crazy to watch and disturbing, but educational too it just taught you about life <laughs> ben you may not know this or you may have forgotten but i had a roommate who had a, a seven foot boa constrictor learned. griffin slept in oh, his room once, learned it. um and uh and he fed it rats and the rats would be in the freezer and i would constantly open the freezer and take one out and then realize what it was Wait, what did you think it was? Like a frozen hot dog? It would just it would be one of those things where I'm like in the freezer. I'm like, wait, uh, okay, you know, we got you know ice cream. We've got frozen dinner. Sure. What's this thing? Oh, it's the rat. Like you, you that's pick not it a up burrito. Like, that's a rat. <laughs> right. Sure. Okay. Got it. What's this like paper towel? Like wrapped around something? What is it? Um, um, but yeah, you would have to take it out of the freezer and let it get to room temperature because otherwise the the snake would be like that thing's dead. Wow. Do you folks know the title thing with this movie? Um, I know that. Oh, you mean the sarcastic memo? Yeah. Yes, Can I know? Ahead, please. Yes. Okay. So they want to call the movie Basil of Baker Street after the books. And then uh, The Adventures of Young Sherlock Holmes came out and underperformed. And yes. Eisner was convinced it was because the movie was too British and American kids didn't like British shit. So he threatened to redub the entire movie with American voices, which he ultimately was talked out of. But they said, like, we got to give it a different title that feels more generic. So they they retitled it The Great Mouse Detective. And then when it was re-released, -rele re excuse me, it was retitled The Adventures of the Great Mouse Detective. It, it, it was, which is bananas. Like, we get it. I mean, he's a great mouse detective. I assume he's not just going to sit on his ass. There'll be adventures. Now, the Disney story people hated this. They were like, this is the worst, lowest common denominator bullshit. That title is so right. generic. It has no character. We're Disney. We're classy. So, right. We don't need to do right. that. So uh, they what, it's still anonymous. They never offered up who it was. But someone um, or I guess, no, Ed Gombert is the name I'm seeing here. Um, yes. Because Peter Although, Schneider was so, the one who came. Uh, what were you going to say, right. David? Yes. No, no. I was going to say Schneider is mentioned. Yes. Schneider was the one Schneider. who came up with the retitling, and that was like an early uh, tension point between him and the animation team. And then uh, he he worked hard to sort of get on their good side after this, and that's where things really started working. But uh, Ed Gombert put together a fake memo uh, pretending to be Peter Schneider, saying that they were going to retitle the Disney classics for re-release in the new style of The Great Mouse Detective. So here was the list of titles on the memo. Seven Little Men Help a Girl. <laughs> we know what that is. <laughs> Straightforward. The, the Wonderful Elephant Who Could Really Fly. Mm. Okay. The, mm. the Little Deer Who Grew Up. <laughs> <laughs> that one's, the girl, yeah, that's true. Yeah. The, this one I really like. The Girl with the See-Through Shoes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, two Dogs Fall in Love. That That's my favorite. Oh, the, the next one's actually my yeah, favorite. This is my favorite. Puppies Taken <laughs> Away. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine Disney being like, kids, come see our new fun movie, Puppies Taken <laughs> Away. Taken Away. And then the last one was a boy, a bear, and a big black cat. That's, uh, but the, those, that, that's Jungle Book, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They leaked out and the LA Times ran them in a piece about like all the attention at Disney animation. And then later that was a category on Jeopardy where those were mm. the right. answers Figure and people had to reverse engineer. Yeah. That's funny. That is funny. I think here's my maybe hot. To, I think The Great Mouse Detective is an all right title. I, do I think so I think too. It's fun. I think it's kind of fun. I think it's okay that it's not called Basil of Baker Street. Basil of Baker Street I mean, really does run into that issue of you being like, I don't know who that's supposed to be, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's less it's Baker less Street. evocative. It's also weird because it's like he's named Basil because of Basil Rathbone, who's the actor who played the guy. So when you call a movie Basil of Baker Street, you're like, is it a Basil Rathbone biopic? 
And like, did, did, <laughs> did, of course, Americans know Sherlock Holmes, but how many of them do know that he's on Baker Street? Like, I, I, yeah, I, that's no a genuine one does. Question. It reads as Basil on Baker Street, and you're just like, what is this, a cooking movie? What is this about? <laughs> Ratatouille. What is this herb movie? I don't want to see some damn pesto well, I movie. Also, when you were talking about that scene where um, Dawson and Olivia meet, Basil, you're like, it's so neat. They don't have to explain what his deal is. And part of that is because the movie's just already called the great mouse detective. So you don't right. have to sit down and be like, okay, so his job is that he's a detective. Like it's right. in the title. I also, I, the word great does a lot for me. The, the if it was called mouse the mouse detective. detective, I would think it sucks. But the great yes. mouse detective, I like this movie's announcing to me. This isn't your run of the mill mouse detective. This guy rules at his job. He is he's the great. great mouse detective. He's got a home chemistry set. Like, I yeah. love that. He fires guns into pillows. I always loved in the in the Disney animated movie when they yeah. would do like little potions and chemical stuff and how it would change colors. Oh, yeah. I hated learning totally. real chemistry. It's not like that. You're not supposed to do it at home either. Right. These are things um, you learn later in life. I just want to point out the poster for this movie is just like white background, all the characters lined up on it. And Basil is swinging across the center of the poster and he's wearing yes. a, a suit, but not his like uh, no, not trench his, coat. His deer stalker, right? Hat. Right. Because they pointedly coat, right? were like disassociated from Sherlock Holmes, less British, less British. Um, but the tagline for the movie is just all new, all fun. Like the selling all point for fun. this movie was just. <laughs> Could be any movie. It's not a re-release. Yeah. It's just, it's a new thing. All new, all fun. I get, the Disney movies were so few and far between at that point. I guess, right. They are actually like, hey, this yeah. is a new one, guys. Just FYI. The and only it's movies they'd released, it's 86, and they've only released Fox and the Hound and Black Cauldron in the 80s yeah. total. And they only and released the, uh, Oliver and Company and Little Mermaid after this. Yeah. I think 101 Dalmatians was the re release right before this, and it was the highest grossing re release they had had up until that point. Like the re release numbers just grew and grew and grew. So it really seemed like maybe there's no need to ever make a new movie again. But yeah, this movie does just well enough, especially because the budget was slashed. Um, right. And it wins the public perception battle because it comes out before Fievel. Uh People like Ebert write glowing reviews and goes like, you know, this feels like the most classical Disney movie in a while. This has right. that quality of animation and feeling and uh, it, artistry. I I think it's the best Disney movie since, I guess, Robin Hood, which is Robin Hood is not a movie I've actually ever loved, but I appreciate mm. its sort of weirdness and it's it, it matters to people like, you know, it's cool. Yeah. I, I haven't seen it in a long time. See, Robin Hood and uh, Jungle Book are, are my number yeah. two and number one, respectively. I do like the Jungle Book. I like their I like that the weird hippie hangout. Yeah, period. right. That yeah, that that, that little period of. Um, Jungle Aristocats, Book, Aristocats, Jungle Book, right? Aristocats, Robin Jungle Hood, Book, yeah. Sword in the Stone, yeah, no, the, right. They're fun. They're, they're Wolfgang right, Reatherman, yes, who was the Wolf, director right, of all those. Exactly. Yes, and uh, those movies are a lot cheaper, and they have this weird, scratchy animation style, and also like they reuse animation from other movies, literally just xeroxed, which is why Little John in Robin Hood is just Baloo. Right, like if we did Reatherman, it's. Uh, I want to get this right. 101 Dalmatians, Sword in the Stone, Jungle Book, Aristocats, Robin Hood, uh, Winnie the Pooh, and the Rescuers. That's that's his yeah. run. Hmm. Wolfgang, baby. Mm. Wolfgang, I mean, I've right. maybe only seen one in those in that run. Really? I've seen Dalmatians, obviously. Sure. You've never I'd... seen like the Jungle Book? No, I never saw Jungle Book. I think because I had oh. the songs on the compilation, and I was like. And I just never got around to it. I was also weirdly sort of, I, I feel like afraid of jungle adventure movies when I was a kid because the big animals really freaked me out. I was like small animals only. Quick yeah, sand that too. Got some size stuff. Yeah, yeah. Quick sand fucks me. Up Very scary. Time. It's so scary. scary. And prominent in the live action one, which I have seen. And I was sort of like, no, 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 none of this for me. <laughs> you like slow um, sand? Yeah, slow sand only. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you would like The Sword in the Stone, Fran. You have Merlin energy from that movie. Mm. Oh. Another, another tortured academic. Oh, of, thank so, you so sorts. much. 
That's that's um, me to a T. Yeah. So uh, yeah, no. Anyway, I, we've said everything we need to say about this movie. The the, the ben, big Ben climax candy. rules. Yeah. Um, right. Olivia's so cute. I feel like we just can't say this enough. <sighs> I love her. But her little she she is voiced by a kid. A real kid. Uh, yeah. She's got that a little, little Scottish, Scottish brogue. It's so sweet. Her I really scarf. you were you were saying that there were like images or stills from this movie that like stuck with you as a kid that rewatching as an adult. And for whatever reason, I feel like the two things I always remember from this movie are the Radigan song and her in that green glass bottle. Mm, um yeah. is always just a very striking image to me from this film. Uh and I was just sort of like all I remember about her is they put her in the bottle. Yeah, it's scary. I, I don't want to be in a bottle. No, you don't want to get bottled up? No, I don't want to get bottled up. Uh, okay. David, you said the box office game for this one was wild. Well, it's more that it's we we clearly just keep hitting movies that are right around here. This was game this is, the, is... Is this Aliens the is it also right 1986? Aliens? It is. It is another 86 movie. What were you saying, Griff? I'm sorry, what? No, that was going to be my exact question. Is this like the weekend oh, after Aliens? Yeah. No, this is the weekend after Running Scared, my friend. Oh, weird. Um, this movie came out July 4th weekend, 1986, which also means that like everything, uh, the top five, like is sort of like holdovers and stuff like this movie's opening number nine and a bunch of other shit is opening and bombing. So psycho three opens this weekend mm. about last night under the cherry moon and big trouble in little China all outside the top 10. Wow, man. So either all going to get forgotten or all growers, you know? Obviously, yeah. I know, Ben, you, you love Carpenter. We'll do him one day. And Running Scared is number six. But Griffin, we I just feel like we've talked. So the Aliens might be one of them. I feel like we must have done another movie recently because a lot of these are popping mm. for me. But number one at the mm. box office is a big sequel to a gigantic hit movie. Is it Rambo 2? No, mm. it is not Rambo 2. It is a kid's movie. It's a kid's movie. Uh, it's a family movie. It's a number two. It's not a Disney. Uh, no, it's a Columbia picture. Hmm. Hmm. 1906 Columbia picture. Is it the Karate Kid part two? It's the Karate Kid part two. Now, didn't we guess that one recently, Griffin? We did. I don't remember why it came up. Yes. Okay. I don't either, but yeah. whatever. Okay. All right. Number two. Uh, Okay, uh, th this one is from, uh, from um, Disney, but uh, it's from, I assume, Touchstone. It's a an adult comedy um, um, with a, a curious star of the 80s that we have enjoyed dissecting his uh, above-the-line career. Hmm, curious. <laughs> a curious star it's, of the 80s. It's like, oh, this guy, right, like 10 years, 15 years in, Becomes a a A list movie star, Devito. Devito, is it Ruthless People? It's Ruthless People. That's the big one for him. That's sort of That's the one the that turns one. it. I would argue. Yeah, it's a children's movie. No, no. but it's Disney. It's it's a uh, touchstone. It's touchstone. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I yeah, understand. First wave of uh, adult movies being greenlit by Eisner at Disney. Gotcha. I've Correct. never heard of this movie. Um, it's fun. Yeah. The Zucker brothers, but doing a non spoof movie, like a sort mm. of inept um, criminals movie. Mm. Right. Uh, DeVito, Bette Midler, Judge Reinhold, Bill Pullman. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Come on. Uh, I, I, we could do Zaz as well. We could totally do Zaz. We've talked about this. That's a great, that's a great blank check. And yeah. I think the way we'd have to do it is we only do the films that all three of them did together, right? So that way we don't have to yes. do, like, American Carol and shit. Might be fun, though. That oh boy. Might be fun to do American Carol, Griffin. That oh boy. It just gets unwieldy if you if you follow all it, it three does. of them into their separate careers. Yeah. But, like, but you kind of want to talk about Ghost. You want to talk about some of these crazy hits First they made. First Night? Anyway. Jane Austen's Mafia? First Night's a weird one. Yeah. Yeah. All right, number three, and again, this is a movie that comes up all the time for us. It's a comedy. It's a big comedy star. He's doing something, <laughs> and it's the title of the movie. He's doing something? The, <laughs> the title is his job? It's not his job. It's what he's doing. <laughs> Take, taking care of business? 
<laughs> Every day. No, it is. He is not taking care of business. He's going somewhere. He's going somewhere. Does it have the word going in the title or is it? No, but think of it as like he's going blank and the blank is the title. Going blank. And overboard? I mean, we talked about. I mean, these are good suggestions, but no. It says, uh, here's what he's doing on the poster. He's uh, one thumb is up, and another is holding something, and he's going. Mm. Is it the landlord? No, because no, that doesn't fit into the hints you've given. I know that's come up a couple times, or the super, whatever that movie's called, the Joe Pesci. Is he? Super it's, it's not the super. I believe Can in I the get- super Pesci. Yes, go ahead. Is he hitchhiking? No. It's it's a he. He's not hitchhiking. Oh, I see. okay. Hmm. Um, he the thumbs up is almost a, a, a non sequitur, I guess. It doesn't really matter. It's just funny that he's doing it. Uh, Griffin, he's an older comedian. Is it back to school? It's back to school. Yeah, this he's one also came school. up recently. We covered right? some adjacent weekend very recently. Yes. I'm gonna have to hunt around to find out. And what I got it was, similarly stumped on it. I got. It's I hard get to stumped set on it up. <laughs> yeah. I will say Aliens is a few weeks from now, but I feel like it's before. We got to yeah. go before. Uh, God, where is it? I don't know. Um, all right. Number four uh, at the box office is the biggest, one of the biggest hits of the year. Of 1986. Yeah. One of the biggest hits of the year. Yeah. What genre? Action. Military. Is it Rambo? Is it Rambo, no. First Blood Part 2? No. It's not. Oh, boy. Is it Platoon? No. I'll tell you what. The star of this movie was recently captured on audio uh, having a go <laughs> at some of his uh, co-workers on set. Is it Born on the Fourth of July? It's not. Biggest hit of the year. Military. But it's a cruise military. Oh, it's Top Gun. Is it not Top Gun? Yeah. Top okay. Gun. I don't think of Top Gun being military, but you're right, it is. I mean, they are in the armed forces. Yeah, no, I just think of it being a plane, buddy. I'm just right, like, well, you know, they're in the planes. They're in the planes. Zoom, zoom. It's just now, about two guys. He, now, this next one, it is just a bunch of guys. This next one. I got to say, if I were on that set and I heard that cruise tirade, I would feel so comfortable. It's true, right? You're like, like Jesus, this goes all the way to the top, this intensity. No, but I'm also like, I'm just so terrified at the idea of being on a set right now because of people mm-hmm. taking safety protocols flippantly. The idea of someone yelling that much, I'd be like, okay, I mean, I know there's going to be no oversight here. Right. Yes. Right. Exactly. He is afraid to die. He's, He's afraid, afraid to, die. to die. And we should God, all be that, afraid if, to die. As am I. <laughs> as just am like I, me. As am I. Uh, but yeah, what if Cruz is like, this is the one thing that could get me. Like he's, he's like, I've gone to, <laughs> I'm going knows. to space. I don't give a shit. He knows uh, <laughs> that COVID could get him. Um, so for number five, this is a movie you'd think from the title, it was about mm. things that fly. But it's not. But it's not. No. You'd think from the title it was about things that fly, but it is not. This feels like a Sphinx riddle. Is it, <laughs> does it does it have birds or something like it that does. in the title? It has a bird in the title. It's not the the Nick Cage uh, one that came up recently, right? I don't think so. The, the Firebirds or whatever yeah. that's called. No, it's a major movie star. Uh, great mm-hmm. poster in which he and two female leads are. Just on a desk, leaning and sitting and stuff. Oh, it's Legal Eagles. It's Legal Eagles. Have I ever read the tagline to Legal Eagles? No, please do. It's so long. It's three whole lines. Okay, here we go. I'm going to need to fucking take a breath. Tom Logan has a law partner who put a dog on the witness stand. A client who can't enter a court, uh, enter a room without a crime being committed. And a case that could turn out to be the murder of the year, period. His, ah. it's like it's like an essay. You got to like stop in the movie, the, the, in the lobby, and like look at that for an hour. Well, that would just be a mini series. Now there'd be like there's three <laughs> yeah. things going on with him. That's a TV show. Legal Eagles. Those are the top five movies. 
Griff, I'm just seeing that Aliens is very soon after this. So maybe we've just done Aliens twice because we've done I think Aliens I remember twice. Top Gun oh. being in box office game when we did Aliens. Yeah, I think yeah, you're right. And I think it's because we did it on the Patreon recently too. Right. Can I throw out yeah. a final thought? Yeah. I feel like, uh, you know, recently uh, Disney Investor Day happened, uh, that national bank holiday where we all sit wrapped around the fireplace <laughs> for four hours and listening to uncharismatic businessmen uh, outline four years of uh, incoming IP uh, brand refreshers. But, uh, the, the, you know, like they did that thing where they were like, hey, we're announcing six new TV shows. They're just six recent Disney animated films, right? We're doing Moana the series and Zootopia Plus and the adventures of Mater and whatever the fuck, right? <laughs> They're doing a Zootopia series, but it's just about like the sanitation guys. Yeah. It's really municipal. Like they're really that getting rocks. into the inner Good. workings. It's called Zootopia <laughs> Plus, which my friend Max was like losing his mind over the other night where he was just like, is the show about a fictional streaming service in the <laughs> world of Zootopia? <laughs> yeah, it's about it's about this startup. There's a whole sequence with a pitch deck. Studio yeah. 60 for the Zootopia world. That would be good. Oh, I wish. The weird thing to me about Zootopia Plus is that it then introduces children to the idea of a sort of like something plus way earlier than I would have learned about something plus and what that means for an object or a site. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Sure. I also Very strange. I mean Go ahead. No, no, what are you going to say, David? Uh, just that Nick Wilde has Matt Alby energy. <laughs> I don't know. I just felt that I should say that. <laughs> Watching this movie, I felt like, oh, this is a kind of thing I would watch Disney Plus make into a TV show. To just do a half-hour Great Mouse Detective show where it's these three and they solve a new mystery every episode. But it feels like, whereas it used to be oh, the things that are really, really valuable, we keep those on like a pedestal. We don't want to diminish the the brand of something like, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, my, my brain is short-circuiting. Uh, do, do series and spinoffs and sequels of like the lower status stuff. Now they only want to like uh, refresh the huge things. But this feels like right. a property that is ideal for doing some sort of new modern version. D do a little mystery oh, yeah. verse with mice. I, I would love Greek. that. Mice, Radigan, clockwork things. Yeah. Mysteries. This is just like Downey where it's just like, just fucking do it. Do one just of these every three it. years. Like what is stopping you? Yeah, and what works about this is how straightforward it is. They could just keep doing the straightforward thing and it would work every time like it typically does with the Holmes adaptation. Yep. Right. Just do it. Now, Absolutely. can I say a new story I just read? Uh, Johnny Knoxville and Steve-O have already been hospitalized two days into shooting Jackass 4. <laughs> Those uh, men are not young. COVID or what? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that should be their big stunt. It'd just be like, hi, I'm Johnny Knoxville, and this is trying to film a movie during a pandemic. <laughs> and then the stunt is just them ben. sitting in chairs speaking until one of them gets sick. Ben, I have to tell you what hospitalized them because I think you're going to enjoy this. Are you ready? I'm ready. Apparently, they got hurt by, quote, jumping on a full-speed treadmill with band equipment. And by band equipment, he means, quote, a fucking tuba. <laughs> Good bit. That sounds great. That sounds yeah, funny. Honestly, I love how they're it. four movies in, and they're like, have we ever run on a treadmill where, like, with a tuba? And they're like, I, the I'm checking. Tuba. I don't think we have. And they're like, great. This thing's going to be easy. Movies are back, baby. Rumors of their death are greatly exaggerated. The, the cinema is back. Big screen, big movie. <laughs> big movie. Fran, thank you so much for coming on talking. My right gosh, thank us. you so much for having me back. This has been such a treat to, to process deep-rooted feelings. Uh, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad we Fran. could start the process, yeah. What'd amazing you say, David? to have you back. Oh, thank Just you. Just amazing to have you back. I said your name. Oh, that's right. We're friends. It's true. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, this is going to be a good miniseries, Griffin. I think it's going to be fun and loose and a nice 
start to 2021, right? Yeah. It's going to be yeah. good. All no. tunes. I can't All wait tunes. to hear you guys talk about Prince Ali, the banger of bangers. Prince Ali mm. is so fucking good. Oh it's so God. good. Oh, God. I know you don't like Aladdin as much as me, Griffin. And I'm sure. No, I'm just, look, I'm, I'm I don't even like it that much, it. but I love that song. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think the the songs are great. Friend Like Me is the one that I, I feel like jumps out to me as the real banger in that soundtrack. But I just Friend no, like I'm just considering the, the Prince Ali take. Friend Like Me rules, obviously. Robin Williams, lots of fun. But Prince Ali has the dun 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 It's so dun, good. Dun, that, dun, that, that is so good. Hmm. I had well, a friend well, once... While sort of DJing while I was driving and I was like, you know, take the, take the phone, play whatever you want. And we had been listening to, I would argue, regular music. And then they were like, hang on, I want to put something on and put on Prince Ali. <laughs> it's like maybe one of the craziest experiences. Uh, and it was it rocked. It was so funny. It's always we good. We need that kind of boldness these days. We do. We need right. that kind of bold thinking to get our country turned around. That's what I'm thinking. If only we had someone in charge of this country with the energy of let me put on Prince Ali at three o'clock in the morning at well, this do party. You, do you remember when Biden like played a, a song from his phone? I can't remember what it was, right? It was like a yeah. Cardi B song or whatever. What if he would played Prince Ali and been like <laughs> a lot of good ideas in this one? You really got to yeah. listen. That would have been good. That's what, that's what might be able to finally uh, bring the, the dirt bag left over to Biden. Maybe I'll vote for him. Prince Holly. Hey, you know what's a weird thing I just remember we're going to have to talk about? What? What? That the fucking Proud Boys movement comes out of Aladdin. Can we just now say that we've talked about it and that's the end of that? Can, we, can, can okay. that be it? Okay. Also, the song was Despacito. It was Despacito. Biden played so Despacito? Right. He sure yes. did. Wow. I have no recollection of this. The remix or the original? Um, I, I think the original. <laughs> I think the original. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, because the version that's popular is a remix. I feel like I just want to have that on the record. Yeah, but I mean, come on. Biden. Biden. I know. Cool I know. I'm just, I'm just saying. Oh, God. I just have one thing to say. He comes out and just says, I have one thing to say. <laughs> Hang on here. He's looking at his phone. <laughs> he just plays it. <laughs> oh, God. I, I what, don't know. What's I almost the flex respect there? it. Is it just him saying, like, look, this is a normal thing I do very <laughs> often on my phone. <laughs> it's right there at the ready for me to play because I do this all the time for fun. I just feel like, right, no one is like, hey, Joe. Uh, come on. I mean, people just don't buy that you're the kind of guy who, you know, goes home and throws on Despacito. Yeah. No one thinks he's doing, no one needs Joe Biden to listen to Despacito. No, no, I think he listens to like the Charleston on a Victrola that he winds up by hand. <laughs> that makes me relate to him. Uh, <laughs> that's the most connected I, I ever yeah. feel. <laughs> It's our thing, Griffin. It's not, you know, our generation will always think of old people as listening to Victrola. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. Biden probably grew up listening to the Beatles or whatever, but we're just yeah. like, that guy's so old. He listened to the Charleston. <laughs> also, just Victrolas are funny. You just imagine <laughs> uh, Biden like like the RCA dog tilting his head up to listen to the horn. <laughs> oh God, I'm sorry. It's a good, this well, is a good goofy start. That's, of course, our episode on The Great Mouse Detective. Uh, Fran, people should follow you on Twitter for Radigan tweets once or twice a year. Yeah, yeah, I'm on Anything Twitter, I'm like on Fran? Letterboxd. Um, my buddy Caroline Simons and I do a podcast about Jude Law called Law School. We record whatever we want. There's no regularity, so don't get comfortable is what we say. Uh, what else? He uh, is daddy, and- though. Oh, he's daddy. He's daddy, he's daddy like to be Radigan. sure. We can talk about this later, but I wonder who will play Smee in the live action remake of uh, Peter Pan. Um, Peter Pan. What else? We do great stuff at Brightwell Dark Room all the time. I don't know if I'll have anything up there by the time this airs, but someone else will have something better, probably. Um, but that's it. I'm not. Do- I'm not doing a ton these days, other than posting tweets about Radigan and then maybe deleting them if they're too weird. Hey. That's the way to be doing it right now. Honestly, this deep into a pandemic, that's all. That's all you. Can I'm having a lot yourself. of fun with tweeting and deleting, and it's like you got it. You see it or you don't. 
I, my, my fun these days is pre-deleting. Sometimes I tweet and then delete it within 30 seconds, but sometimes if, I just draft it out and then just never send it. I will say- If I have a tweet, it goes to Joey Sims, usually. If, if it's a tweet wow. that I'm not going to tweet, it just goes right to Joey Sims. I test a lot of tweets by David, I will say. Yeah, I appreciate he's a, it. He's a good soundboard in that way. Yeah. Um, folks, thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. And thanks to Lane Montgomery for our theme song. And Joe Bone and Pat Reynolds for our artwork. And go to our Shopify page where uh, the uh, Talk in the Walk 2020 shirt is uh, uh, shipping out. And if you want to be a little Basil of Baker Street yourself, hopefully uh, at this point someone has cracked the code for where the the mystery uh, surprise secret episode is. Right? With our listeners, someone's probably figured it out at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, tune in next week for The Little Mermaid, uh, an obscure uh, animated film of the 1980s that changed the entire <laughs> industry and perhaps broke Hollywood forever. <laughs> Multiverse of madness, baby. Multiverse of madness. Uh, and as always, uh, Radigan is uh, an absolute unit. Look at the size of that man. Yeah, he's a chungus. <laughs> <laughs>